Uh, this is Chris VK3 Alpha Mike Lima, uh, based in Burwood East in Melbourne. And every Saturday night at 9:30 p.m. we have uh, a regular transmission, a test transmission on 147.475 megahertz uh, narrowband FM on the two-meter ham band, which I run in parallel with this YouTube live stream. And um, as a result of that, uh, we usually have 90 minutes worth of uh, material, video material, audio material related in some way to ham radio, which gives uh, an opportunity afterwards for ham radio friends to call in on this transceiver. Um, an FM, FM seven, uh, FT7900 and uh, uh, with that information at the start, the 90 minutes worth of video, we provide sufficient material, I hope, for uh, a long discussion on ham radio to follow. So that's the intention of this. It was a, um, a tradition, I guess you'd call it, instituted by my predecessor with my call sign, the late Tony Sanderson. VK3AML who died in 2006 and um, was carried on as a tradition also by Dave Stewart VK3ASC who I believe is now going for a broadcast, an HF broadcast license uh, somewhere in the area of 2.3 megahertz. It'll be interesting to see what he does with that. I believe also he's planning on moving to the bush but at, at this stage I have no, no details. Uh, just a bit of news. There'll be a, a ham radio gathering Columbia Park Wheelers Hill in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne on Wednesday the 26th of January 2022. And uh, it's being organised by Tom VK3FTOM, young chap in his teens and uh, we hope to have as many ham radio operators uh, up there as possible. I'll be there with my VHF transceiver and uh, a computer tablet interface so that we can transmit pictures of the event at that time. OK, it's 9.30pm, um, just time for me to go on the air. Hello, this is VK3 Alpha Mike Lima in Burwood East, um, commencing the regular Saturday night test transmission for the 15th of January 2022. If you want to look in as well as listen in on this transmission, um, try googling VK3AML 15 January 2022 and that will bring you the video side of this transmission as well as the audio side. Um, each week we pick a different subject to cover, which mostly has covered travels in the last few weeks to Deal Island in Bass Strait and to New Zealand. But on this occasion I thought, uh, after discussions with my wife, who's a retired psychiatric nurse, and I hasten to add we didn't meet professionally, <laughs> it's always something I have to throw in, um, we decided to put together a transmission on a common amateur radio problem or at least a problem common to radio amateurs and that is the affliction known as hoarding h-o-a-r-d-i-n-g hoarding and it ranges from mildly humorous in terms of packing one's radio shack with gear some of it obsolete through to a real affliction where the amount of equipment is such that one cannot move or carry on a reasonable, uninhibited personal life. And uh, in the course of tonight I'll play uh, some videos and audio material relating to amateurs who somewhat comically live in a cluttered environment through to other amateurs, one of whom actually died when the mess that he lived in literally collapsed on him. 
Um, at the end of the uh, 60 minutes to 90 minutes of material, I'll play some interviews with a professor of psychology, Dr Randy O. Frost, and another one, Dr Grande, about hoarding disorders, which are an actually a, a, a psychologically uh, diagnosed illness, a psychologically a categorised illness today. Um, I'll just check my streaming to see that... Um, oh, I think the streaming is working OK. It's just coming up. Yep, good. Um, and I don't think I've got any lost frames this week either, which is good. So first of all, um, it was suggested by Peter Parker, VK3YE, that I should include the famous clip of VK, the late VK2XBR, Julie Kentwell, big Julie Kentwell, of Sydney, um, actually of Springwood, out towards the Blue Mountains. Uh, this video clip dates from about 1987 or 88, and Julie was one of radio's real ratbags, brilliant, but a ratbag, and he died in September 2005, uh, possibly of smoking-related disease. As you'll see, he's chain-smoking right through this clip. Anyway, without any further ado, let's look into the ratbag but likeable ratbag life, the likeable ratbag cluttered hoarding life of Julie Cantwell, the late VK2XBR. Finally tonight, there's no doubt the television industry is an uncertain business, but at one end of the industry, people couldn't be less concerned. They're the amateur TV buffs who tend to make things out of junk and who have little interest in transmitting pictures except to show they can. They also tend to be slightly eccentric. Jeff Sims has been sharing the world of the ham man. Welcome to the shack, but don't kick the BMAC receiver over. I use that to watch the ABC from the satellite from OSAC. It mightn't have the mock Hollywood glamour of some network channel foyers, but don't go on appearances. Uh, it is a television station, it's a radio station, it's a ham shack, it's a development laboratory. It's a bit of a mess too, isn't it? Well, there are two types of shacks. Those that are an absolute pigsty and those where nothing happens. Picture, sound. <laughs> Amateur television, like ham radio, has a touch of theatricality about it, such as improvisation. This equipment is all built out of junk, and it works. Love my beautiful purple blue lips. That's the camera doing that. Good evening, and welcome to ham television. You can't be sure about that, clown. I can't be sure. And introducing, live from his Springwood studio, uh, Shaq. Don't miss it if you can. My name's Julie VK2XBR, and there's Brian VK2K Mill. So once you get your amateur ticket, you forego your surname, and you substitute your call sign for that, and there and after, so you are known. Right, this is VK2FP. He transmitting from beautiful downtown Sunny Heathcote under a 500-watt bowl. Why did I look into that 500-watt bowl? Never mind the bulb. Why does a ham man blind himself with science? To fulfil that urge to create, I suppose, that drives a sculptor to make something ugly and stick it up in the middle of Melbourne. I mean, it isn't any use to anyone, but he had to do it, didn't he? The sculpture here at Springwood mightn't be a lot of use to anyone either. It's more a plaything. Go on, take a bite. You've wrecked the rest of it. You might as well wreck that bit. So the cocky's upsetting transmission. Not really. They've tried to. Give them another five minutes, I'd say I won't have another antenna left. Well, which way are you pointed? Is that Sydney down there? Yep, straight through. Somewhat south of the city centre. Julie VK to XBR's aerial sculpture sets him and his house apart from the neighbours. Their sculpture is no less original. They just keep most of it below the roof line. But those birds, birds outside, and more birds inside. My life is a mountain of bird seed. Why is that? What's happened up here? 
Well, the canary sprung a leak and all his seed keeps landing on all the equipment in the ashtray, on the mirror, on the robot slow scan, on the junk. If you took the bird out of the cage and let him fly around the room, he'd never starve to death. But I don't, I don't want to be too logical. Floor. I don't want to be too logical, but why do you have birds in your radio shack? Well, every electronic engineer knows that a spurious emission from any piece of electronic equipment is called a birdie. If you're tuning on a shortwave radio and you hear a <laughs> go through, that's a birdie. How does it go? Oh, right. Or it could go, or it might go. Who knows? Hello, Ferdinand. How's my fat rat? Well, out of place, perhaps, but no more than most other things here. He is none of the things that are normally ascribed to rats. And he's rather enjoyable, if you want the truth. And I suppose, if you want an honest answer, I have him purely for the perversity of it. If ever Ferdinand should break out, he'll face a ready welcoming committee. Fifteen cats permanently kept indoors. Our cats are never allowed out. We lost two to the cat thieves to cut them up for fur, and we had one run over. So from there on in, we kept them all in, the idea being if you keep the cat in, you keep the cat, such as this useless ginger thing here. Who's he or she? That is the duck. Cluppy, you went to sleep in the middle of it, you fascist pig. OK, you're ready to uh, take tonight's gas bag night? Back to amateur television and bringing in a picture of ABC off satellite the hard way. I mean, any fool can go out and buy a TV set and an antenna and put it up, in Sydney at least, or surrounds, and watch TV. That's no great challenge. For me, the challenge is to get the picture direct from OSAT. Now, I should have sound... That's the sound from ABC TV. But if I switch the TV over, that's ABC radio, and that's all coming from the same thing. What was that yum, 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 yum bit? Oh, that's on the TV. The predecessor to the afternoon show. In a word, success. But it's that overwhelming urge to do a, a sort of inner drive which I can't control, which controls me, that pushes me. That is the place to be. And I hope to see you there. In the meantime, catch you later. The late Julie Kentwell, VK2XBR, filmed in 1987. Well, he was a likeable hoarder. Um, a lot of amateurs, you know, including myself, look at all this. If, if you're looking in on the YouTube live stream, which you can find by googling VK3 AML 15 January 2022 as a phrase that is Google VK3 AML 15 January 2022 you'll find the video that goes with this audio I'm transmitting on 147475 and uh, this week incidentally we've got uh, a new audio peak limiter which is uh, limiting nicely but I notice it's picking up the... For every step forward, you have a step back. It's picking up the noise of the uh, cooling fan inside my power supply, which is a bit on the rattly side. So I will have to do something about that eventually. But like Julie Kentwell, this is amateur television of a form. Um, a very interesting YouTube site is run under the name Hi-Fi SSB. It's a German ham radio operator and uh, in the current period and he also talks about his uh, hoarding habits but in his case he has them more under control. He has actual storage containers and shelving which is more than some um, hoarders can speak of. So over to um, this amateur, he doesn't give his name on any of his uh, um, on any of his YouTube clips, but have a look for his channel. It's a very interesting one under the name Hi Fi SSB H I F I, and uh, let's have a look and see what he says about his own hoarding habits. I have to admit, uh, I have a problem. Over the years I've turned into a hoarder, and uh, the problem right now is we bought another house, and we're going to move, 
and uh, I'm going to lose all this space. It's about, uh, I would say, seven by seven meters or so, so nearly 50 square meters. And uh, it's full of uh, crap, really. See these shelves behind me? I've got uh, 22 of them in here, and they're all packed. Some of this will go into the warehouse, of course, and uh, thankfully I've got some people who have sense and they will sort this out, but the rest needs to be dumped. Um, I've got so much stuff in here, it's unbelievable. We're in this place now for the past 10 years, and uh, at first this was all very nice and empty, and I had a massive uh, table space here and uh, just some radios on top, but nothing else really, a washing machine in the back. Um, but then you start buying and buying and buying and um, for future projects or just because it's cheap or you want to have a, a punt. Um, for example, um, see this instrument up here? I ha don't even know what it's good for or when I bought it or how much it was. Next to it is a power supply, also never used. On top of this is a very expensive CAF um, center speaker, which I purchased years and years ago and uh, connected it once and uh, well it ended up on top of the shelf it hasn't moved for five years um i used to make a radio contact a day minimum that was my 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 goal either come here in the morning have a quick contact before i'm off to work or in the evenings um but that hasn't happened for some time either i also wanted to make more videos for this channel um, i even bought this uh, rather nice uh, Panasonic camera with a brilliant microphone. And look, look, cobwebs on top. Um, I'm still going to do it once I moved, but uh, I have to cramp all this now into 25 square meters, maybe. So five by five meters. It's still a big space for, for many people. And you might think a lot of space is a blessing, but if you have this kind of hobby, it's a curse. It's not a, it's not a blessing. You fill it up. You know for yourself, if you're a keen uh, radio amateur and you go to these boot sales and junk sales or swap meets, whatever you call them, wherever you are in the world, you end up with a box of goodies and you store it away or you put it in the loft or in the garage or wherever you put it, it's there and you probably never ever touch it again. And I'm the, I'm the same. Some of the stuff is bought purely for business and uh, I don't really know why it ends up in here. I do some of my work in here in the evenings or at weekends, um, but most of the job sh should be done in the warehouse and it's being done in the warehouse by my guys who, thankfully, greetings by the way, hope you're hard at work, um, who take care of things down there. But now I have to move and it's uh, scary really. I have to come to terms with the fact that um, a lot of stuff has to be thrown away. Now I could put it all into boxes and take it to a junk sale. Um, but I haven't got the time, the will, or the energy, so uh, I'm afraid there will be some bargains to be had on eBay. I put them on soon, bulk bags of some sort, but the majority will go to the tip, to the recycling center. Metal bits, chassis, um, old components that nobody uses anymore. Um, some monitors possibly. I've got 18 monitors in this in this um, room, and I, I'm only using this one and the one on top and that's about it oh yeah and the cctv monitor as well but uh, the other ones are just surplus to requirements um i even have two massive flat screen televisions in here i should you call them televisions not flat screen anymore i don't think the old style is still available um yeah stuff everywhere and i need to get rid of it i don't know where to start i st well i do know where to start i started last week already i took um I would say easily 20 to 25 boxes to our local recycling center. Uh, mostly metal, mo mostly old components, plastic bits and pieces, uh, f scratched front panels from uh, vintage radios, um, packaging material, which has become obsolete, really. Yeah. And there's much more to go. I mean, just look at the, at the video cl clips uh, in this video and you see how much crap there is um if a box says ft990 for example on top it doesn't mean there's ft990 parts in 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 there because these are all in the warehouse these boxes contain various bits and pieces and i lost track what's actually in these boxes so i have to go through them one by one and we're talking about what two or three hundred of them oh god 
Help. Maybe I should just abandon this place as it is and just start from scratch. But the hoarder in me says, no, you can't do this. You have to take as much as humanly possible with you. Um, what's the point to all this? Uh, none really. It's more like, a, like my own personal diary. But if you want to take something away from this, um, if you're already a material, have any kind of hobby and you tend to accumulate stuff, think about your loved ones. Get rid of it as long as you're alive. If you're a guy, your life expectancy is uh, shorter than that of your wife. So uh, at one point your wife has to deal with all this crap, really. Um, I highly recommend to label up the expensive items in your shack, expensive radios, amplifiers and uh, microphones, whatever. Put a little label on the, at the back and uh, let your wife know what the value is so she can sell it off. And uh, whatever hasn't got a label, let her throw it away or even better, throw it away while you're still alive and while you can. So um, don't end up like me, hoarding and hoarding and hoarding. Think about your loved ones and get rid of some stuff that you don't really require. And then from that point on, don't buy any more because there's no point to this. Oh, well. <laughs> Unless, of course, you really hate your wife and then you might as well buy even more stuff. Just thinking, really. Well, I don't, so I have to get rid of the stuff now and uh, to get ready for the move. And hopefully next time uh, I make a video, I make it from the, from the new shack. Um, well, that's it for me. Thanks for watching. If you got bored halfway through, I do apologize. Next time we make another nice uh, little radio review and I'll let you know my thoughts on uh, vintage gear. Um, until then, stop hoarding. Get, go to the tip, get going, sell it off at boot sales and only keep the good stuff. Um, thanks for watching and thanks for your subscriptions. And while you're here and you haven't subscribed and you're new to the channel, click the box down be below with a little bell icon so you get a notification whenever I upload a video. And um, I'll see you at the next one. Thanks for watching, everybody. I better get cracking. Fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> what else can one say? That was Hi-Fi SSB's channel. He doesn't give his name, obviously with a Germanic background. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether he's a German amateur in Germany or whether he's sa uh, somewhere else, Australia, possibly USA. Hi-Fi SSB's channel. Now, um, unfortunately, the, the news on Hi-Fi SSB is that since that clip, he has posted another one on hoarding and Hi-Fi SSB, like many of us, is a true ham radio tragic. So let's have a look at his subsequent clip. <laughs> And please do give his channel a look. Hi-Fi SSB. And here's the man. Well, well, well. Not much time has passed since I gave you a small lecture about uh, uh, hoarding amateur radio equipment. And uh, guess what? Uh, last weekend I have been shopping and I couldn't help myself. Uh, it turns out it's a, it's a proper addiction. I bought myself a lovely Tentec Orion 5 transceiver together with uh, its uh, original power supply, desk microphone, and even an external VFO for a very, very tempting price. I couldn't really say no. I was perfectly um, prepar prepared to do some work on it. But it, as it turns out, it's, it's a lovely transceiver. With, it works without fault. And this will stay in my shank for a long, long time as my main rig. Uh, I just like Tentec equipment. I can't help it. I know many people will say, well, it's... Um, it's homebrew equipment in a way, um, but I love it. It's easy to service and uh, for the most part they look quite nice too. Um, I also bought um, ICOM IC746 transceiver with a slight audio fault. I fixed that was only a transistor and a surface mount um, capacitor that needed changing. Uh, that's all done now. That's working rather well. And I also bought uh, a TS440S, which was uh, sold to me as fully working. And it needed a slight tweak up, but other than that, it turned out um, all right. To my defense, the uh, TS440, uh, we were a bit short on, on parts in the warehouse, so uh, I bought this uh, purely for parts only to offer to you guys so you can keep your radios on the air. Um, and I bought some bits and pieces, I bought an automatic antenna tuner as well. Not that I need one, my anten antennas are all tuned. Um, well, most of them are tuned, my vertical is not. Um, and some bits and bob, I think an oscilloscope, uh, which I don't really need. 
and uh, the usual RF connectors, whatever you come across, really. I have more than, than enough, but I thought, hey, what the heck, for a fiver, let's get another bunch. So, um, yeah, this is what happened within the space of one week. I, can't, I couldn't help it. So, um, forgive my lecture from before, but I stand by what I, what I said, um, throw some stuff away and keep the essentials. Um, what is essential is of course up to you. Um, yeah, that's it for me, only a quick one. It's more like uh, my own video diary of how stupid I was at the weekend. And uh, I'm convinced the, um, it, will, it will carry on like this. I'm going to buy more and more stuff. I guess I can free up some space if I just uh, throw away some of my chassis. I just have to take all the good parts out and uh, the bulky stuff can go um, uh, to the recycling center. So I've got all these uh, um, old FT 101s, ZDs, 901s and 101Es etc. on the shelf. Uh, still good parts in there, but I don't need uh, the bulky bits. So uh, the front panels are mostly scratched anyway. So I need to, at one point, recycle these. Oh my God. <laughs> you can see I have quite a few of them. About 40. <laughs> and this is only my private. I throw stuff away on one side and on the other side I get stuff in. But to my defense I try to throw away more stuff than I buy. I keep you updated and uh, thanks for watching. Please subscribe. That was only a short video. Not much to say really. Um, yeah, and by the way if you have anything for sale just contact me alright. <laughs> See you later guys. See you on the bands. Bye. The delightful Hi-Fi SSB YouTube channel. Um, thoroughly recommended. If you're interested in ham radio, go there. Uh, and the fact that the guy is honest enough to admit the hoarding sickness, although he seems to have it in check in terms of storage space, uh, the fact that it causes him some angst is, is of concern. Now, this sort of hoarding disease is not strictly confined to people interested in ham radio gear. It also affects people who are into computer technology, the younger generation. And uh, I was amused to find this clip uh, made by um, a, uh, a channel called Linus's Technical Tips and uh, two guys in their 20s talking about the hoarding of computer technology. Uh, some of them, <laughs> some of this computer technology goes back to the days of 486s. So let's have a look at that. If I were to say the word hoarder, you'd probably think of like those reality TV shows where there's a bunch of boxes everywhere and there's junk strewn all over the place and there's like bugs and rotting food and everything's just gross. Hey, Linus. Well, Brian the electrician. He's always been a little different, but he's also a different kind of hoarder. So take a step inside Brian's domicile here where we're gonna see exactly what a tech hoarder looks like. So everything looks pretty normal so far. You know, family pictures on the walls. Got China cabinet. Perfectly normal you know, dishes and stuff. So, I mean, this is all pretty normal. You got your Xbox, your computer. I mean, wow, haven't seen one of those in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> the, the keyboard attached Xbox 360 controller. Controllers, there's a random mouse. Okay, there's, <laughs> this seems like it might become a bit of a recurring theme. This is not plugged into anything. It's just there. It's just there. Well, I know why it's there. It's there in case you know, someone loses track of the wireless one or the battery dies, you just have an emergency mouse just yeah. within arm's reach at all times. Now that is a sign of a true tech order. You've got an AC adapter that isn't plugged into anything, an ethernet cable that isn't plugged into anything. Oh no, I knew it. An IO shield. <laughs> You'd never know what room we're in if I didn't tell you, but this is in fact- The kitchen. The kitchen. So we've got ourselves uh, not one, not two, but three computers. Yeah. And I'm told that these two are um, just a, a modern machine for recipes and cooking. Couldn't use a tablet for that. 
And a little Minecraft. Okay, machine number, a little bit of kitchen Minecraft. Uh, number two is an old Windows XP machine for retro games, which yeah. naturally you would play here in the kitchen. Well, you know, just if uh, I can't make it down to the basement. These are a classic. Oh yeah. These are beautiful. You have a non-plugged in D-Link <laughs> access point. Third computer, not plugged into anything. Oh, look at this relic. It has a serial port. Wait, it also has a display port port. Oh my goodness, there is so much dust in that DP port. That looks like it has never been used. Probably not. Yeah, we're gonna head downstairs, but Brandon, you just about tripped over another computer right there. Wait, well, hold on a second. Why is this one here? It's gonna go downstairs. It's gonna go downstairs. You know what? Well, look, Brian, we're here to help. All right, here we go. We're descending. You never know when you're gonna need 300 feet of ethernet cable. Oh my goodness. What the hell is this? This is very early LCD technology. I feel like a tech archeologist. Like what is this, 2005? Property of Blessings Christian Marketplace. Oh, that's uh, from Two Michelle's old work. Manufactured January 2004. Yeah, I would accuse you of stealing it, but I'm sure they didn't want it anymore. And that was 10 years ago. Oh my goodness. Is this a PCMCIA card? Yes, it is. I love that they called 10100 fast ethernet because that is not fast. Okay, I could give you a pass on the extra mouse in the living room, but this yeah. is three mice and three keyboards on a utility sink. Yeah, to be cleaned. To be cleaned. Okay, this is a three button mouse with no scroll wheel. Yeah. The best way to clean that is in a melting vat so they can reuse the plastics to make something modern and useful. Is that an iPad one? Oh my goodness, I forgot how chonky this thing was. Look at how thick this thing is. And I actually thought we were done in this corner. I was looking under the desk. I was like, okay, you got your racing, but what is this? Why is there a CD drive down there? It's there, no, there's no good reason. You may you may stop actually, explaining. There is. It's to keep the pedals from moving back when I'm playing the driving. To keep driving. the pedals from moving back. Yeah, the pedal bumps against the drive. You're it works perfectly. You're literally using it as a doorstop. Yes. Is that a CD changer? Why? Don't you have Spotify, sir? Actually, I'm just using that as an amp. All right, now we're into what is very obviously the wifey PC. So uh, I couldn't help noticing that she doesn't yeah. have nearly as good a rig as you. I saw that uh, Minecraft is struggling a little bit there. What's your excuse, sir? My excuse you're is You're gonna that have this much tech and you're not gonna have her Minecraft running at 100 plus FPS. That's the interim PC. I have another one in the workshop that I've built for her. We're gonna see if that story checks out. At least she's got a laptop. It's been a bit of an older model, tough book. A second gen i5. Oh, it doesn't even have a USB 3, dude. Yeah, it's a tough book. Doesn't need USB 3 to be cool. What do you think, guys? Do I look cool? If I do, it's not the laptop. LTTstore.com. Anyway, this is a second home theater PC. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with a TV in the basement, but come on, man. More yeah. than one home theater PC also. An old amp. Also, Two one amp, amp is not a problem. Two amps is a problem. This one's not hooked up. And this one is not hooked up. Not yet. What is this? Oh my goodness. A late, I had a LaserJet 6P. Still works. 10 years ago and it was used. You guys may not know, this is a gravity fed model laser printer, which means that the print reliability, while the text is very crisp, it's very poor. The toner cartridge in this, uh -huh. I got filled back when I was in high school for $40 and it's still on the same fill. Right, but that's because you're not actually using it. Not right now, I used it for a lot of years. Still going. So I'm gonna have to knock a few more points off for these speakers that are next to a TV, but not actually hooked up. And not then, yet. And now it's time for the workshop. Now, yeah. so far this has been, I'd say a moderate case of tech hoarding, but my understanding based on all the things Brian claims to be working on all the time is that there's definitely another level that we can ratchet up to here. You'll see. Ow. Ah, very funny, Justine. 
Oh my goodness. Oh man, okay. <laughs> Where do we even start here? What do you have a box machine for? That is the Minecraft server. And does this Minecraft server actually serve to anyone outside of this house? Yes. Oh, it does. Okay, yep. so you're running your own Minecraft server. Yep. Out of this, by the way, very nice, love it, wooden server cabinet. Just as long as you don't have a fire, everything's fine. Uh, the top one is storage. All right, how much storage is in here? Right now, three terabytes. You have an entire 4U for three terabytes of storage? Uh, it's also redundant. All the drives are in RAID 1. Holy smoke. So do you just like rock out in here? What is this What is this amplifier you got going on here? I need better speakers to go with it. I'll say that right now. But that's a 500 watt two channel Rotel. So there are already some fascinating relics in here. This AIO has got to be at least 15 years old. That is a first gen i3. That's a machine Michelle was using. I just need to make sure there's no pictures on it before it goes to recycling. More wrapping paper, very funny. I couldn't help noticing that there was an entire list of uh, software serial keys. Some of it useful, some of it probably less useful. PC Cillin Internet Security 2008. I remember that, that's a classic. That's when I started that database. Sims 2, wow, you own the entire Sims 2 series. And you solemnly swear every single one of these keys is legit? Yes. All right, I might hit you up for some, no, don't, don't worry about it. Windows 95, Windows 98, and 98 SE. Okay, now this is something I think we can all agree can just be thrown away. So, so you work with an electronics recycler, but to do what? To just hoard more? Uh, yeah, it's, I, I, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I rescue machines I find interesting that I actually have an interest in, as well as any stuff that I don't have room for or I've lost interest in or that doesn't work, I just, I, I'm able to bring it back and get rid of it. Got it, got it. The motherboard on the wall behind this screen, Yeah. that was my first machine. Really? That board was in a computer that my dad bought new in 95. Wow. And then when he got a machine to replace that, yeah. It was handed down to me. Since then, the barrel battery leaked out onto the board, wrecked some of the traces. I hope to find another one, but I still have the rest of that machine, which is up on the shelf. It's the old Comtex. Oh, interesting. So that machine started all this. Look what you did. Oh, interesting. So this is like VGA capture. What could you possibly hope to do with this kind of stuff? Well, at least this one's got VR out. I mean, some of this stuff wasn't even good when it was new. Sound cards. How's that for a sound card? <laughs> Look at this thing. It's got a RAM slot on it. Old AWE32. Look at that. Gold Star. Didn't they become something else eventually? LG, that's right. Lucky okay. Gold Star. Nuts. So this is from 1995. So if you're complaining about how your, your you know, RTX whatever doesn't fit in your case and needs to be so big. So this is a modern graphics card. Yeah, it's a little bit on the thicker side, but in terms of the actual <laughs> length. Oh, is this Quadro 6000 work? Yeah, yeah, it does display. I haven't booted Windows up with it yet. Damn, Daniel. Okay. <laughs> Floppy and IDE, IDE cables. Yep. Oh no. Got a thermal paste rag in here. Got some random modular power supply cables. Yeah. Got some more ribbon that's, cables. Got that's, some overflow. That's the mix drawer. So there's actually some decent stuff in here. That's an HX1000. Yep. Piles upon piles of AMD coolers. This is like some socket. Holy crap, this is socket 462. So basically that's why you have three terabytes of space because this is all just like- Recycled drives. Recycled drives. And that's why you run RAID 1. Yes. Because this is all recycled drives. Exactly. What's this Fujitsu? 2.57 gigabytes. Oh, yes, no. my friends. Look. This is back when, you know, 100 or even 10 megs really counted. Check that out. Or this one. Seagate Metalist, 631 megs. So this is probably similar to the drive that was in my family's first computer. Yeah, so this is probably around the, the neighborhood of my family's like upgraded drive in our 386. So we talked about these actually in our Drive Savers video. They actually have a ton of old stuff like this lying around that is in working order because they never know when they're gonna get like 
a nuclear power plant or something that's still running hardware from this generation that's like, hey, our drive died, we need to get the data off of it. So I feel like there has to be a rhyme or reason to this. The very, very top is old, more, much more vintage. Socket 7, Socket 3. Sure. Wait, is Socket this outboard new. cache? Yeah. Wow! Coast module. So guys, cache didn't used to be integrated right next to the CPU. Instead, you had to actually install cache. Now, the, the theoretical benefit of this is that if your CPU didn't have enough cache for your workload, theoretically, you could upgrade it with more cache down the line. Optical drives for days. I just purged a bunch too. Did you now? Yes. Couldn't tell. Got some of them iMac uh, power cables. Do these work? Uh, those ones I think have graphics issues, so I'm probably just gonna salvage the drives and RAM out of them. And Bummer. That's the thing about all-in-one computers that's so uh, frustrating and wasteful, hey? Yep. As soon as they stop working, you can't even use them as a monitor. Although some of the older iMacs I think you could, but not the newer ones anymore. Is that an EPC manual? Why would you even have, why would you care about, why would you keep this? Because I actually have one a friend gave me. For well, yeah, but you don't need the manual. It's just it, powering on your EPC. Install the battery pack, connect the AC power cord, turn yeah. on the EPC. I've never actually looked at the manual. Complicated. Ew. <laughs> Gross. No, no, don't look at that. Don't look at that. We're, we're done here. IO shields. shields for days. You know, I always keep these things just in case I ever encounter that board again or like find one that happens to have exactly the same layout. Yep. It has never once paid off. Oh my goodness. Cyrix CPUs and you got a whole shelf. Of the, why? These are worth more in gold than they are in functioning processor. Oh, that's a 133. A 133, oh, with the integrated fan, huh? Yeah. Bet you could overclock the snot out of that thing. Athlon, Athlon XP era, very nice. One gigahertz K7. A lot of people don't know this, but AMD was actually the first to break the one gigahertz barrier. The more you know. Oh, socketed laptop chips. It's gonna be like Banyas Core, like early, Early core series, I would guess, right? Uh, core two, I think. Oh, wow. A Gravis gamepad. Okay, now this had a really amazing feature for the time. You see this uh, threaded insert right here? So you could actually take this little winky joystick and you could screw it into it and then you could use it like a, like a, like more like an arcade stick and like a fight pad. So a lot of you kids probably won't know this, but before there was a three and a half inch floppy, there was a five and a quarter inch floppy. Yes, my friends, I forget what the capacity of these was, but one thing is for sure, Adventure Math fit on at least two of them. Risk, disc one of two, disc two of two. Oh man, there was a great Risk custom map for Supreme Commander that seems to have been lost to the bowels of the internet, unfortunately. Hey, if anyone out there is watching and you still have that old Supreme Commander Risk map, let me know, it was flippin' awesome. Okay, so I gotta know the stories behind at least a couple of these. So this one you were saying was your very first PC. Yep, that's the one that started it all. Oops. Now this is a classic right here. Turbo button. This really did make your computer go slower when it was activated. Common misconception. A lot of people think the turbo button was designed to make your computer turbo up when it was enabled. But actually, it was because computers were too fast for games and games used to have their physics tied to the clock speed of the CPU. So when CPUs got too fast, they needed a way to enable compatibility for these old, poorly coded games. So you would press the turbo button and it would actually clock your computer down. So my parents, when I wasn't allowed to use the computer, used to lock it and our power button wouldn't work anymore. Little did they know I had a key for it as well, but. I haven't booted this up in years. I still need to fix the keyboard on it, but it did work is the last Is this the compact portable PC? Yes, it is. Wow. No way. So guys, the way I could actually tell, not because I, I recognized it immediately, was just because 
I knew that it had a handle on it that looked just like this. So there you go, the entire back of it is the computer. There's your five and a quarter inch floppy drive. There's your, I don't know, what is this, like a seven, eight inch CRT I, I monitor? I think it's an eight inch, it's green monochrome. And you've got a brightness dial. Yeah. And this is actually the plus model. It has a hard disk. Wow. Technically, they're right. It is portable. Okay, so to challenge Brian to prove that there's a use for this collection, I said, okay, find me a game I used to play. I want to play me some Commander Keen right now. So he pulled down this 486, and this was what particular variant? Uh, this is a DX2, so clock doubled, 66 megahertz. I'm surprised you. EGA track. Look, I used this crap. Remember when the speaker was built into the computer? <laughs> oh, it is too. I don't know what the controls are. I thought it was space. It might be control or something. Oh. That ah! it looks like some demented dog. What is this? What? I, I'm stuck. What the crap? Uh, you, you need the key. Now our final piece of tech archaeology here is this. This is an AMD based laptop. Yeah, it's a K62 366. Holy crap. That display is horrible. Even with the pointer trails on or even without <laughs> no. them, you'd basically have point this pointer, pointer trails pointer are off. Trails? Oh, That's dear. not pointer oh. trails. Oh my goodness. It's horrible. Are you sure they're not on? Positive. Can I double check? You can double check I believe all you, you want. But can I double check? Oh wow, they're off. <laughs> what if we turn them on? <laughs> <laughs> That's awful. How far we've come. Don't forget to give uh, Linus technical trips. A t <laughs> Sorry, Linus technical tips. Uh, Linus Tech Tips actually channel a look. If you're into computers as well as ham radio, it's an excellent channel to uh, uh, YouTube channel to dial up. Uh, you're listening to VK3 Alpha Mike Lima on 147.475 and via YouTube live streaming, which you can access by googling the phrase VK3 AML 15 January 2022. That is, Google the phrase VK3AML 15 January 2022 and you should find us. With the time at 10.15, I'll now go on to the more serious side of hoarding. It can become a sickness, a real sickness. And um, some uh, hoarders, well, there is a, a trailer for a program called Hoarders, and I hope I won't get into copyright trouble for running this. I'm just checking that I haven't so far. Good, I haven't. Uh, where a woman had filled her entire three-storey mansion to the roof with crap. Just crap. And you'll see um, her long-suffering husband, who had some sort of lung complaint, um, cried to get their kids to band together to try and get this thing uh, sorted out. Now I'm sure that you and I know several radio hams who almost live in as bad condition as this. The ones that you've seen so far at least had their gear shelved off the floor with ample moving space but when you hamper your own lifestyle to the point where you can't move in your own home, where it becomes dangerous to you from the point of view of, apart from everything else, fire prevention, uh, it's a real worry. The program Hoarders, this is a trailer for the program, only runs about five minutes, but shows you one of the worst cases of hoarding that they located in America. Carol of Ferguson, Missouri, and have a look. It's a beautiful house. And right now it's in chaos. It's easy t to happen if you're interested in a lot of stuff and you collect it. I'm 
you know, eventually things can get out of hand and it's all my fault. My name is Dave. Carol is my wife. I think Carol is a hoarder, absolutely. Carol brings things in, but very little of it leaves. At this point, the house is full, and I mean full. <laughs> Sad is the condition of my house. I've always been interested in a lot of things. I've collected a lot of things. And I especially like that elusive thing that maybe I'm shopping for, you know, something special. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, the sound is beautiful. Thank you. We need a lot of energy for today. I'm Dorothy Brenninger. I'm a professional organizing expert, and I specialize in hoarding. We've got one big mansion many rooms, and lots of stuff. So I've been in the house, and this is a massive hoard. This is huge. Carol, any last words? No, let's get on with the show. Okay, with that, I'm going to take Carol's advice. Family members, I want you to start heading toward the front. Bio one, you need to suit up, because you're gonna be in the heavy of it. Let's go. <laughs> I actually can't believe how much I miscalculated. This is so massive. And believe me, we do not have all the rooms out yet. We've got 24 tarps full, and there's more coming out. He said missing a cue. Well, that um, uh, hoarders program indicates how severe this illness can become. And uh, it applies also to ham radio. Um, there is a clip for which I don't have a video, but um, this is an obituary for a ham radio operator in America named Skip Bynum and he literally died in a house full of rubbish when his ham radio equipment fell on him. Uh, it's only one minute long, um, but here we go. Skip Bynum, a uh, review of his house being cleaned out after his death. Men wearing masks used rakes to remove the debris inside. Friends never knew this is how Skip Bynum lived. I'm gonna remember that picture. I'm gonna remember him smiling, even though he was losing his teeth. Search dogs had to walk over hordes of trash to find him dead inside his own home. People have dignity in life. People contribute more than you ever realize. This man gave 35 years of his life devoted to this community as a communicator, and he deserves to be remembered for those things and not how he died. We watched on Friday as contractors filled up their third large trash bin. But they set some things aside, giving you a sense of who Skip was, an old ham radio, toy models, and a family Bible. He did woodworking, he was very involved in trains, he went to train shows, collected trains, uh, he was a devoted Baptist. Friends and neighbors say he lived here with his mom until she died. Skip wasn't married and had no siblings, so Code Compliance hired contractors to clean it up. We started Wednesday and we're still currently doing it now, so we, seem, we uh, need probably a couple more days to, to uh, remove the debris. The city calls it a unique situation. Friends say it's sad that no one knew this is how Skip Bynum lived and died. One of the real tragedies of ham radio is when hoarding gets so out of hand that it actually affects your own lifestyle. And in the case of Skip Bynum, led to his death. 
So I think we can all um, be warned about this. In my own case, my hoarding, as you can probably see way back there, um, relates more to books and printed literature than it does to uh, ham radio equipment. I try to keep the ham radio equipment down to material that's reasonably modern. I've eliminated all but a little of the valve gear that I've got. I have one uh, audio peak limiter from about 1962 X2BE Beager and then used as the first limiter at 3CR um, in 1976. I keep it for sentimental reasons and it's a nice piece of vintage Australian made AWA equipment but I wouldn't try to use it. Its attack time is way too slow by modern standards. Um, for that matter I should mention that this week we're running a new audio peak limiter uh, my own audio peak limiter has been on the fritz for some weeks so I decided to try um, a replacement and was uh, very graciously um, given access to Andrew Wright's um, Behringer uh, audio peak limiter volume compressor uh, Andrew Wright vk 3 bk thank you very much if you're listening Andrew and uh, all of our audio is being passed through that um, to keep levels constant and the compression up and uh, it seems to be doing a sterling job I can't detect any d distortion on the stream I might have a listen I might not have aligned it with the levels properly on the stream before starting we'll see eventually uh, in terms of the way people get into strife buying junk uh, before Covid all of us, I'm sure, went along to ham fests, and the last really big ham fest I went to was the EMDRC ham fest of 2019. And along with many other ham radio tragics, you'll see the saga of that. I'll try and do a commentary as this goes through. This is VK3AML, incidentally, testing on 147475, the regular Saturday night test, and also streaming on... Um, uh, a YouTube live stream that you can access by putting the phrase into Google VK3 AML 15 January 2022 over to the 2019 EMDRC Hamfest in the Nerdfest video there is Dave disappearing up the road up there Dave 3 ASE, and this is the car in which 3SL and 3AML arrived. The usual hubbub in the suburb. There's double ZC and 3SL and 3MET. I can see Dave Ranson in the background there. Some of you might be recognising yourselves. There's um, 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 Jack 3 Triple W operating the spatula. This is where the profits really made. And there's the starting whistle. Dave Ranson again. Drew Diamond, 3XU. And Tom, VK3FTOM, some years ago. Dave Ranson again. And 
here we are in the hall. And please note all of the hoarders, all busy finding more for the hoard. The WIA book counter. An increasing uh, emphasis on software defined radios, I notice, even in 2019. Adam, VK3SKT in the background. Selling a microphone by the sound of it. And there's Tim, VK3FTZD with the ponytail. I should point out for people watching from interstate that the Eastern and Mountain Districts Radio Club Ham Fest is probably the largest Melbourne ham fest. There's VK Steve, who is back to us. And there's the said Andrew Wright, VK3BK, falling asleep behind his counter. <laughs> I should have nicked something. Jeff, VK3VJS, on the right, somewhat stunned. There's a camera up me nose, what do I do now? Laurie VK3SJ, I think, on in the centre there. This is the 2019 EMDRC Hamfest. PK's loops were there. The usual loop up on the tripod there. Very good for lower HF and medium wave reception. Three MET, three ATO. Three ATO on the left, three MET on the right. ATO we haven't heard so much. Well, there's Murray, VK3, MJT, and 3 MET. Oh, we're in the advanced electronics uh, boxes at the moment. Looking at a diode from about 1930. Will be very useful if 1930 ever comes around again. Right, Amita. Now what I'm going to have to do. So she's got me. There's. Um, oh dear, dear, dear. Anthony Rogers on the right there. And double ZC holding his hands above his head, describing something to someone. Michael. This is the first time I met Michael. He later had a brief stint as the president of the MDRC. 3MET trying to dodge my camera. Some hope. And uh, there's Steve, 3SL, buying something from Michael. Myself. <laughs> Ian, VK3ST, and um, Don, v Don Bainbridge, VK3BIG. This is just outside the front door again.
I think this was towards the end of the show. Three double ZC, there's Dan Murta on the left. Anthony Rogers at the back there with the glasses. Anthony Rogers, VK3 JIA. Sometimes it's hard to tell who's at these shindigs because you know their voices but you don't know their faces until you tie one with the other. And that was the 2019 EMDRC Hamfest where many people have saddled themselves with huge amounts of junk. <laughs> and I'm not excluded from that category. Something I thought I'd throw in was some professional uh, psychological analysis of um, the psychology of hoarding. And this is quite serious. Um, I think it's worthwhile listening to. I have two excerpts before we go over to uh, live chat of um, prominent psychologist Dr. Randy O. Frost, the professor of psychology, talking about the psychology of hoarding. Um, among the things that we think are, are, are part of the cause for hoarding behavior have to do with the way in which people process information. Uh, and, and we think that people who hoard process information in several unusual ways. One of them has to do with the nature of things they pay attention to. People who hoard pay attention to the unusual detail in objects, like the shape, the color, the texture, and so forth. And they don't necessarily have the same view of these, uh, of these things in terms of what is the most important feature, for instance, uh, of a bottle cap. You can focus on the shape and the color and the texture and maybe give it value because of that. Or you can focus on the fact that if it's a bottle cap without any bottle associated with it, maybe it has no useful function. One of the things that is related to why this develops, we think, is the way in which information is processed by people who have hoarding problems. Attentional problems are, are, are one feature of this, where there's a tendency to, to focus on the unusual detail of, a, of an object, and that gives that unusual detail more value. Another characteristic is, ha, has to do with the way in which we think about objects. And, and the way in which we organize our lives. Most of us organize our lives categorically. So if we get an, a, an electricity bill in the mail, we put it in a category for, called bills or a category called electricity bills or something. So when we need to find it, we can go to that category and locate it and do whatever we need to do with it. But people who hoard seem, for the most part, to live their lives a little bit differently. Instead of categorically organizing Thing, the things in their lives. They tend to organize them visually and spatially. So if you ask someone with a hoarding problem where their last electricity bill is, they're likely to tell you that it's somewhere in the middle of the pile in this room and maybe a foot down in the pile because that's the last place I saw it. So the organization is, is by remembering in space where objects are based on when I saw them last. Now, a lot of us organize some things this way. The top of my desk is organized that way. I've got piles of things, and I remember what's there because I last saw it there. But if I were to do that for all the possessions I owned, that system would break down quickly, and, and pretty soon I would, I would have a non-functional way of organizing all the things in my life. So this, this problem with categorization is one of the ways in which the processing of information is a little bit different in people who hoard. Another feature of the information processing that we see has to do with the amount of information people pay attention to with respect to an object. So a person with a hoarding problem will, will look at an object and focus on all the unusual details of that possession. And those details will have meaning, they'll have importance, even things that are, that are more aesthetic than u utilitarian. So they may focus on the shape and the color of, of bottle caps, rather than the fact that the, this bottle cap doesn't have a bottle to go with it and therefore it has no useful function. Um, <clears throat> what happens then is when people try to make a decision about this object, they're faced with many more details to consider than most of us are. 
And this leaves them with it, that difficulty in being able to make a decision. And it's one of the deficits that we see in people who hoard. Making any kind of decision, taking a large amount of information, filtering it down, and use it to, using it to come to a conclusion about something seems to be very difficult. And, and we see this often in people who have hoarding problems in everything they do, from ordering off a menu at a restaurant or deciding what clothes to put on in the morning. These are decisions that sometimes they struggle with for long periods of time. And we, we think it's related not so much to a deficit, but, but rather a, an extra amount of information that they're paying attention to that the rest of us don't. Uh, and for a while, we thought that perhaps people who hoard were more intelligent than the rest of us because they had this more complex way of thinking. I'm not sure that's true, but, but I do think that people who hoard may have a more of a creative streak than the rest of us because they notice the unusual detail in objects and they appreciate those details. They're, those details are given importance. And that, I think, is a mark of, of creativity. The unfortunate thing is that this form of creativity it also runs, gets them into, into trouble. So it's almost as though this is creativity run amok, that it's too much creativity and they can't manage their lives because of it. Now, all of these information processing deficits seem to be associated with a particular area in the brain. And indeed, some recent research suggests that there are differences in what happens in the brains of people who hoard in these areas that, are, that control these kinds of information processing functions. So we're seeing some overlap between what we're learning about the ex their experience of these possessions and what's going on in the brain. And Dr. Randy Frost uh, summarises the causes of hoarding related to the way hoarders process information, people who hoard process information in unusual ways, they pay attention to unusual details. Electricity bill is somewhere in the middle of the room in a pile, about one foot down in the pile. They don't have it categorised properly. Hoarders have a difficult time making decisions. They focus on unusual details of a possession rather than its usage. Now, that's not the only... I shouldn't um, limit us to one psychiatric uh, assessment of hoarding as a problem. And I'm sure I'm speaking to the converted with most of people here who would ad admit to some degree of that. And certainly after watching some of the clips that I've presented to you tonight, I've decided to clear out parts of my... Uh, storage area, I'll, I'll, I think I'll apply something like a 10-year rule. If I haven't used a part for 10 years and I can't see myself using it for 10, in 10 years' time I'll be 77, or, or dead. <laughs> so um, I'll uh, make a rule that we um, change over. Anyway, what is the hoarding disorder and how is it different from OCD? Let's look into another clip, this time by Dr Grande. Uh, on one of the internet sites uh, talking about hoarding disorder. Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks, what is hoarding disorder and how can it be differentiated from obsessive compulsive disorder and obsessive compulsive personality disorder? Other questions would be, does hoarding disorder have a relationship with autism spectrum disorder? And what is the treatment for hoarding disorder? So first, let's take a look at the definition of hoarding disorder as we see it in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM. So we have several criteria here that have to be met for a diagnosis of hoarding disorder. So criterion A, we see persistent difficulty discarding possessions regardless of value. Now, I've seen a wide range of possessions here used to meet this particular criterion. We see a lot of products made of paper. That's fairly common, like newspapers, magazines, books, and mail. I've also seen other things like plastic bags, plastic products of other types. Boxes are somewhat common, like cardboard boxes. And every now and then we see something like clothing or even hoarding animals. Moving on to criterion B. Here we see that the difficulty that we see with criterion A is due to a perceived need to save the items and to distress associated with discarding those items. So they want the item 
and they have difficulty getting rid of the item. And there's a lot of different reasons for this. Utility is one reason, like they believe the item is useful. We also see aesthetic value. They believe the item has some sort of value in terms of artistic value, beauty, something like that. We see sometimes a strong sentimental attachment, even to objects like newspapers and magazines. We see that somebody doesn't want to be wasteful, so they feel guilty about getting rid of something because that item may have some sort of value. And we also see a concern about losing valuable information. I see this a lot when it comes to something like the mail or newspapers, right? Somebody gets a lot of mail over their lifespan and they're worried they're going to need one of those letters or documents later on. Now this behavior, this accumulation of all these different products is intentional and not passive. Some people do accumulate things more or less by accident. They just hold on to things and they just find later on they have a lot of that. That's not what's happening here. Again, there's an intentional component to it. Moving on to criterion C. The difficulty results in the accumulation of possessions that congest or clutter active living areas and substantially compromises their intended use. So people have difficulty moving around their house or apartment and they can't use the items that they are hoarding. If living areas are uncluttered, it's only because of third party intervention like family members. So somebody can still meet Criterion C if the family members cleaned out the cluttered areas. So activities of daily living like getting dressed, cooking, or making one's way from room to room, these activities can become difficult or impossible with all the clutter. I've seen some incredible levels of congestion associated with hoarding disorder. Stacks of newspapers and magazines or just narrow pathways were available. And if the stacks of paper would collapse, it could actually be pretty dangerous. So the pathways are really just extremely narrow and somebody's kind of making their way through and all these stacks of papers and magazines are shaking and kind of moving toward the middle. So again, it can get a little bit scary. I've seen situations where the subflooring of a house is actually cracked under the weight of magazines, newspapers, and books. And similarly, situations where walls were damaged from these items leaning against them. And again, all that weight and pressure. I've seen situations where rooms of a house were completely inaccessible due to clutter. I remember this one situation where boxes of newspapers were in a basement and there were so many that you couldn't even move down the steps at all. You couldn't even hit the first step going down into the basement. Now sometimes hoarding behavior gets confused with collecting. Like a lot of these items people think, well maybe somebody would collect those types of items like magazines. Well collecting is typically organized and systematic. Although, the quantity of products may be similar to what we see with hoarding disorder. With collecting, people also usually display items to interested parties. Usually this doesn't happen with hoarding. Somebody with hoarding disorder typically doesn't want to show people the books or magazines or newspapers. Now moving to Criterion D, here we see that this difficulty, right, keeping all these different products in the house and not getting rid of them, causes clinically significant distress. So functioning has to be affected. If functioning is not affected, the diagnosis is not given. Now it's important to remember here though, if somebody has poor insight, they may not report distress, even though that distress is actually happening. Now, I'll just interrupt that there to say that uh, in about five minutes, I will open it up on 147.475 for discussion. And please note that this uh, Dr. Grande is talking about uh, general hoarding disorder. But I, I know that people who collect uh, ham radio equipment um, frequently are uh, motivated by different things. Sometimes they lose sight of the ultimate function of the material and they collect for security, personal security, fearing that um, perhaps the equipment might be a, a guard against the world uh, or in some cases uh, I know of ham radio operators who feel that they would be belittled or diminished in some way by getting rid of any of the equipment that the equipment has become so much a part of them that they are psychologically incapable of either selling it or throwing it away um, the, the involvement of a person with his possessions is really a worry 
And it took me a while, particularly in my 30s, to realise that a man is not his job. A man is not his possessions. A man is his own... Is, well, is master of his own domain, if he chooses to be. And people who are in the grip of hoarding are not masters of their own domain. Anyway, five minutes, we'll open it up for discussion. Meantime, we'll have the conclusion of the talk from Dr Grande, uh, clinical psychologist, on the affliction of hoarding. With criterion E, we see that the difficulty is not attributable to a medical condition, like a brain injury. And with criterion F, we see that it's not explained by symptoms of another mental disorder, like obsessive compulsive disorder, major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, or autism spectrum disorder. Now here's where it gets a little bit confusing. Hoarding disorder can actually be comorbid with OCD, even though it doesn't seem like it from this particular criterion. For both disorders to be diagnosed, the hoarding symptoms have to be independent of the OCD symptoms. So those are the diagnostic criteria for hoarding disorder. We also see several specifiers. One popular specifier is with excessive acquisition. So this is when an excessive number of items are coming in. It's not just a failure to get rid of stuff, right? So we see that 80 to 90% of people with hoarding disorder meet this specifier. And a lot of times the excessive acquisition is due to obtaining free items. So what this really comes down to is that you can accumulate items normally, right? Everyone gets mail. Most people would get newspapers, magazines, or books at some time in their life. And if you never throw anything away, that can cause accumulation. When we're talking about the excessive acquisition specifier, someone's actively obtaining new items. They're going out and they're finding stuff and bringing it back, usually, to their residence. The other specifiers have to do with insight, and better insight is associated with a better prognosis. So the first insight specifier is with good or fair insight. Here a person recognizes that the hoarding related beliefs and behaviors are problematic. Then we have with poor insight. The person is mostly convinced that the beliefs and behaviors are not problematic. And then the last insight specifier is with absent insight delusional beliefs. And here we see that the person is completely convinced that the hoarding related beliefs and behaviors are not problematic. Now I mentioned animal hoarding before. This particular type of hoarding is associated with poor insight and an increased risk of unsanitary conditions. Now how about some of the characteristics we see associated with hoarding disorder? Well we see perfectionism, avoidance, being disorganized, procrastinating, being highly distractible, and indecisive which is an interesting mix because perfectionism is associated with high conscientiousness, but of course indecisiveness and being disorganized is associated with low conscientiousness. Overall though, individuals with hoarding disorder tend to have low conscientiousness. They also tend to have high extroversion, which is kind of surprising because we wouldn't think that extroversion would be related to hoarding disorder at all. And they tend to have high eroticism. This part isn't really that surprising. So how about the general course of the disorder? How does it tend to come about and what tends to happen over the lifespan? Well, we see that hoarding disorder actually tends to begin relatively early in the lifespan, usually the late 20s, and it worsens across the lifespan. However, about 25% of people report an onset after the age of 40. Someone over the age of 55 is at three times the risk to have hoarding disorder as compared to somebody between the ages of 34 and 44. Individuals with hoarding disorder tend to live alone. It's not clear how living alone and hoarding disorder are really tied together. If somebody has hoarding tendencies and they happen to live alone, is there a greater chance that the symptoms are going to manifest because no one is there to stop the hoarding behavior? I've seen instances where a person was married and there was no hoarding behavior and then their spouse died and the surviving spouse started hoarding after that. Now, that could be because of trauma and distress associated with losing a loved one, but another part of it could be that there's simply no one there to keep the behavior in check. Now, in terms of prevalence, we see that about 2 to 6% of the population has hoarding disorder. There's a significantly higher prevalence in males, but among clinical samples, females are overrepresented. 
So females with hoarding disorder are more likely to seek treatment. Females are also at a higher risk to have excessive acquisition specifically through buying, right? So I talked about the excessive acquisition and how it's mostly related to obtaining products that are free. Well, with females, they're at a greater risk of going out and buying products and bringing them back to the residents. Now, moving on to comorbidity, this is when mental disorders tend to appear together. We know that comorbidity is substantial with hoarding disorder. 75% of people with this disorder have at least one comorbid mood or anxiety disorder. 50% have depression, and many have social anxiety disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. About 20% of people with hoarding disorder have obsessive compulsive disorder. So this brings me to another question. How is hoarding disorder different than OCD? With OCD, the behavior associated with that disorder is usually unwanted and very distressing. People don't get any pleasure or reward from engaging in the compulsions. Excessive acquisition is usually not present, or if it is, it has something to do with a specific obsession, not because of a genuine desire to possess the items. For example, if someone with OCD has a fear that their personal information is going to be taken and used against them, like a fear of identity theft. They may keep every magazine that they touch because they're worried that now their fingerprints are on that magazine or their DNA is on that magazine. So they keep the magazines to be safe, not because they think the magazines have some sort of value or it would be wasteful to dispose of them. Another difference between hoarding disorder and OCD is when you see an accumulation with OCD, it's usually some sort of bizarre item like hair, trash, or rotten food, something like that. Accumulation of these types of items is rare with hoarding disorder. Is hoarding disorder actually distinct from OCD? There's a large debate about this. We know that hoarding disorder is a useful diagnostic classification because it can guide treatment in a meaningful way. So we're better having the classification than not having it. But many argue that it's actually a monosymptomatic form of OCD, meaning it's a type of OCD that only has one primary symptom. Many researchers, however, agree that hoarding disorder should remain a separate disorder regardless of its relationship with them. And I'll cut that there. Um, we're due to open up shortly for um, a chat about all of this, um, serious and funny hopefully, on 147.475. Uh, I want to thank also Andrew Wright, VK3BEK, for his loan of the audio peak limiter that we're using tonight. It's made my life a great deal easier in throwing together clips and audio to know that the audio is being looked after automatically. Um, allows me to concentrate on program content rather than on problems. Uh, and I'm very surprised that we haven't had more problems that we, than we've had uh, because I note that the clips that I'm playing vary from 23 to 30 frames per second and I wasn't quite sure how uh, the OBS software that I use for streaming was going to handle that but it seems to have handled it admirably, on this week anyway. Uh, I actually have um, a Behringer peak limiter on order, the same as the one that um, Andrew has let me borrow, and hopefully that'll arrive in two weeks and become a permanent part of the equipment here, because it certainly does help. So thank you, Andrew 3 bk if you're watching. So without any further ado, um, I'll uh, now go over to the receiver on 147.475. This is VK3AML calling now CQ. And let's see if we can raise anybody for a chat. VK3AML calling CQ on 147475 and standing by. And VK3 Echo Charlie Gold. I got VK3 ECG, uh, but there was another um, station in there. VK3AML standing by. VK3 BLX. Ah, 3BLX, g'day. Um, well, we'll take 3BLX first. Um, nice to hear you in there, John. 
um, and I hope the audio through two meters is as good as the audio through um, the computer. Uh, it's all limited anyway, peak limited to the same level, and it was just a matter of uh, aligning it before the transmission. VK3 BLX and group VK3 AML. VK3 AML and the group VK3 BLX. Yes, and good evening to everybody else there. Another fascinating evening. We've certainly got a, uh, a wide variety of uh, topics there to choose from. Excuse me. Uh, very interesting, the hoarding, I must say. Uh, particularly interesting since I had a sister who was uh, well and truly in that category and uh, caused me no end of anxiety when our mother passed away and uh, she was left living in the house where she lived most of her life. With, uh, our parents, she never married and so on, she lived with mum through mum's later years and uh, when mum, well she sort of started boarding but when mum went she sort of really took off. So yes, very interesting uh, evening, uh, very interesting program. Anyway, pass it around, VK3 AML, VK3 BLX. And we say morning. And hello 3EGG, John. Um, yeah, thanks uh, John 3BLX. I had a bit of trouble uh, routing you through the appropriate channel on the mixer, so I had a bit of a switch around. Uh, there would have been a bit of dead air on the uh, the stream, so apologies for that. I'm just getting used to the controls uh, with the new limiter in. So we'll now go to VK3CG. Dave, uh, note that you appeared in the video there. I don't think I knew you actually when... Um, we were shooting that video of the MDRC Hamfest. Uh, VK3CG and the group VK3AML, how's your week been, Dave? Yeah, uh, VK3AML and the group VK3ECG. Um, I hope my uh, audio um, sounds okay. I changed over microphone for a dynamic mic and uh, um, uh, a little bit better, probably for egg chewing rather than uh, um, uh, sort of. DX communications, but hopefully it sounds uh, reasonable. Um, yeah, look, fascinating topic, and um, one that yeah, I've got you know, quite a bit of experience of one way or another. <laughs> a little bit of personal, I'm sure. Although I must admit, I took an extraordinarily large bin bag worth of clothing to the um, one of the op um, shop um, um, bins and things at. Um, it, one of the shopping centres today, actually, um, feeling very virtuous, having uh, um, cleaned out a, a fair chunk of my walk-in wardrobe. <laughs> but um, uh, before I realised you were doing this topic, um, I hasten to add that it wasn't a sense of deep embarrassment. Um, but yes, absolutely, it's a, it is a significant condition and it's one that I've certainly um, had both um, family issues like you, John, in terms of a particular cousin who has this and still has this issue and um, um, I once remember staying with him and he, he said I've got a camp bed he said uh, because all the other beds bedrooms in the house the beds uh, were completely covered so uh, but there was nowhere to put the camp bed um, so um, because every room was full and so we literally had to move things to the wall and stack them up against the wall to create a space sufficient to put a camp bed down so yes, um, I have uh, ex experienced that. And the other side, I suppose, is, is the increasingly um, it's an issue that we see in, in, in forensic practice. So I've been called to many a many a place um, where someone's been found deceased, and um, and that is what the house is like. And um, of course, if it does turn out to be um, uh, uh, a non-natural death. Uh, or intervention by somebody as a, some form of homicide or other um, post-assault process, then, um, of course, the forensic evidence collection in that sort of environment um, is horrendous. Um, you could imagine if somebody did break in and assault someone in that sort of setting, the capacity to find trace evidence or in, um, of such a, a third party entering the premises and to collect that evidence in a meaningful way becomes absolutely impossible. Uh, so, so there we are. But it is a it is a fascinating 
condition and um, has some interesting links with uh, a general syndrome of the Diogenes syndrome, which more on later perhaps uh, from VK3 ECG. Diogenes syndrome, that's a term I've not come across uh, before. I should know more about my Greek, is it Greek mythology that Diogenes got involved with? I'm not quite sure. Oh, or that was involved with. Yeah, I've known quite a few uh, people who are compulsive uh, acquisitors. Um, 3SL, Steve and I and another chap named Briefett Cleave were in charge of uh, cleaning up a deceased estate 11 years ago of a chap who was nominally a record collector but just kept on filling up his house more and more and more until he had two double garages, five bedrooms and a huge living room just stacked with stuff with a narrow alleyway to walk between the front door, the bedroom and the bathroom. And in the bathroom, even the shower was stacked with material. Now, uh, I could be accused <laughs> of being a hypocrite here because of our two bathrooms, the little one that's adjoining my radio shack and the one, the big one that's up the other end of the house. I invariably use the big one so that the, the shower <laughs> in the next room is actually stacked with kites and spare material for light beam communication. So I can't be completely accused of being innocent in that regard, but I have to consciously, I think particularly at my age, 67, um, discipline myself to restrict myself to material that has some viable usage to me in later life and considering I probably have maybe a decade of good life ahead of me there's only so much that one can do we're not in our 20s anymore and uh, we haven't got 50 years to look forward to and with that over to VK3 double G how are you John how's your week been and uh, did you see much of the video VK3 double G in group VK3 AML Yes, 3AML, VK3 EGG. Yes, I, I managed to get it to work this time. It came through like normal, unlike the other week where um, uh, for some reason I couldn't watch it. Uh, and I haven't bothered to, to look at whether it came up later on. I've been meaning to, but I've just uh, forgotten each time. Yes, it was all quite interesting. Some of those issues I've seen on some of the TV programs as well. Um, yeah, so it all worked quite well. And uh, it was quite yeah, I'm not sure what that beeping noise was there, but anyway, um, yeah, John, um, I know we were, when we were much younger, uh, both of us had piles of junk, uh, me at Torring Road and you at Shakespeare Grove, and uh, uh, as time has gone on and as valve equipment has been replaced by solid state, uh, I probably have the same amount of functions of equipment, but the equipment itself is much smaller. Um, and I have to really debate with myself if I ever buy anything that's valve equipment in, at this t point in time. Um, so VK3BLX and the group uh, VK3 Alpha Mike Lima. VK3AML and the group VK3BLX. Yeah, well, it made me feel a bit better about my shack when I saw some of those uh, <laughs> those collections, especially the uh, the first one with the uh, what was his name uh, uh, Julie or someone, wasn't it? Uh, Julie Kentwell. up in Sydney with the early ATV stuff. My goodness, I like his excuse that uh, there were two kinds of shacks. I thought that was very very clever. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Dave, I can just imagine how you'd feel when you had a crime scene to investigate and it looked like that. Uh, to start with, my goodness, where would you start? Yeah, uh, I also actually had a, uh, a cousin who passed on just fairly recently and uh, one of the other family members had the unhappy responsibility a bit earlier, actually a year or two earlier, of moving him out of this house that he lived in for many, many years into more 
uh, habitable accommodation because he had absolutely filled the house to the top basically it was one of those houses you couldn't move from room to room uh, but it wasn't just junk it was also sort of um, food remnants and all this sort of stuff you know so it was it was pretty horrendous from what I gather luckily I didn't didn't have to see it uh, but it was a big job <coughs> getting him out and then clearing it out it must have been awful so uh, yeah um, it is strange I'm, I'm sure most hams in the back of their mind have a little bit of a tendency to to, uh, to hoard. I mean, that's what the junk box, you know, that's where it starts off, isn't it? What was it once described, where you uh, keep all those precious parts that you uh, are certain you're going to need one day until their value is finally recognised and the whole lot's sent to the tip. BK3AM, on the group, BK3BLX. Well, I, I think um, the message that was given by that psychologist, or rather... What was his name now? He gives his name as Hi-Fi SSB, the German chap, that you should have uh, pity on your family by at least identifying the equipment that they could sell and separate it from the equipment that they should tend to the tip. Um, here I have a, a number of passions which I have to moderate. I'll just uh, pick up the webcam and see if I can turn it around at some of the problems that I have here you can see that's one of about eight bookcases that are scattered through the house and uh, I've been a real um, hoarder for information which up to the time of the invention of internet of course came from books incidentally that room there with please knock may be occupied is the loo <laughs> so um, when I put on the uh, the video clips, <laughs> I quite often nip in there for a quick slash, uh, checking each time, particularly now that I've got decent uh, audio peak limiting, that uh, the the audio on the mic channel isn't up. <laughs> Everybody gets regaled from a, a broadcast flush across Melbourne. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'll just see if I can turn it around. There are also filing cabinets there. There are eight of them with um, the product of my work in broadcasting and documentary film correspondence. I really should go through it with a lot of it, either with a shredder or with big boxes I can take to the council, um, the council high temperature furnace to get rid of. But as you will see there, at least I've got my parts categorised into transparent boxes and... Um, slotted away with most of the floor quite clear so if anything does catch fire I can dash for the door without too much trouble and I'll just put that camera back on its stand pointing up slightly thank you and I'm very glad to say that uh, both the audio and the video have uh, gone through tonight without a single lost frame so First of all, we solved the uh, the problem of the uh, defective modem that we had and the defective connection with NBN. And now, through the help of Andrew Wright, um, obviously we know which way to go with the audio. The, the peak limiter has been a real boon and leaves me free to think a bit more about what I'm going to say and how I'm going to sequence the video clips on this, remembering that each of these Saturday night efforts are rather extemporised ad lib. Um, I can't spend all that much time preparing this. Um, I am a family man and I do have a family to look after as well as ham radio, so this becomes a hobby. You have to put it in its order of priorities. Um, so we'll hand it over to, I think, uh, VK3, VK3 CG again. What is the Diogenes syndrome? VK3 CG and group VK3 AML. 3ACZ. And acknowledging Peter. Yeah, uh, from VK3 CG. Yes, good evening, Peter. Um, 
Yeah, well, Diogenes was uh, one of the Greek philosophers, and um, he was the one who used to wander around with his lamp um, during the day, looking looking at people and holding the lamp up, um, arguing that he was looking to find an honest man. Um, uh, so he was basically um, uh, one of the um, uh, sort of the philosophy school of cynics that became sort of migrating to Stoics, I think. But anyway, they, um, essentially they believed in a high level of virtue and really abjured all, um, all possessions, really. Um, I think it was so to say as Diogenes that he, he, he lived in a, in, a, in a ceramic, one of those huge ceramic jars in a marketplace. He, um, um, uh, he had almost no possessions. At one point he was supposed to have had a... Um, owned a, a cup to drink water out of, but then he saw a boy drinking water out of his hands and said, well, then I don't need a cup. Um, so he was, he was that, that sort of character, but actually was apparently very, uh, very witty and, uh, and um, uh, uh, you know, antagonistic to quite a lot of other sort of philosophers. But the syndrome really relates to this sort of, this, uh, really this sort of social isolation of old age, uh, again, often accompanied by hoarding um, but also um, really a, a way in which a person retreats from the world and ceases to care for themselves um, and often goes with hoarding because they basically don't get rid of things and, and they just gradually accumulate rather than the, the disorder of hoarding, which is a more emotional disorder about um, an inability to decide um, whether... Um, you, you need to keep something or not and seeing value in things that they don't have to other people um, and that was partly what they, I think they were talking about and talk about you know people storing things that are uncategorized and they they, 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 they um, utilize space rather than have a place for the object which I think is really quite a, a, a good way of, d of distinguishing it and when he was mentioning a little bit about that um, the sort of brain studies that have been done hoarders, it's really, again, that when they're trying to make a decision about whether to keep something or not, um, they actually get activation of parts of their brain which are related to areas that control or are associated with emotion. So they are emotionally challenged by whether to keep or throw something away rather than having that uh, sort of intellectual, do I need it? So I argue it has a more emotional value, and perhaps that's what he was getting at when he was saying that the they may be more creative or might have more of a sort of um, uh, creative, imaginative, um, um, you know, skill or ability set. Um, it's fascinating, really. It's, it's, it is it's such a distressing thing to see at the same time, though. Um, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> I like your reference to the uh, um, using the, the small room. Um, the, work, the one that always used to frighten me was um, being wired up at a conference with lapel microphones and wireless microphones and then at the end of your session nipping off to the loo and uh, forgetting to turn off your microphone. Um, and that's happened. Uh, I, um, I've certainly heard that and people rushing off to try and get to the person before they uh, uh, do anything further. <laughs> anyway, Chris, back to you. Uh, VK3 AML and the group VK3 ECG. Yeah, well... Uh... <laughs> I um, I've experienced people doing funny things with microphones before walk, walking off and having conversations with people in which four-letter words particularly were used. Um, <laughs> never had anybody go to the toilet with one on. I I, I gather that you have some sort of a story in that connection. Um, and interesting about Diogenes, I wasn't aware that there was a syndrome with his name. There was a syndrome in America called the Collier Brothers Syndrome. The Collier Brothers were very wealthy brothers, fairly highly um, uh, cultured. Um, one was a musician, I think the other was a writer, and they were both in their 70s and retired. They had one of the brownstone buildings in New York in uh, which they had moved into when Harlem was a fashionable suburb, but of course it slipped as time went on and became rather violent. So these brothers tended to retreat to the protection of their um, environs in the brownstone building, and they gradually filled the brownstone 
from floor to ceiling with newspapers and junk and musical instruments and furniture just stacked right up. And eventually one of them had severe rheumatism and was stuck in something like a wheelchair. And his brother, one of the other Collier brother, went out to buy food and bring it back. Well, they had, because of their worries about security, booby traps um, between the front door and uh, the brother in the wheelchair who could only be accessed through, would you believe, tunnels in the junk. Not just alleyways, but tunnels you'd have to crawl through. And what happened was, uh, on the way back in, the brother getting the food had disturbed the tunnel too much. It gave way and uh, a hundred weight of junk fell on top of him, pinned him down, killed him. And the other brother died of starvation. Um, when this was discovered some weeks after the death of both of them, they didn't find one of the brothers for a very long time because he was buried, literally buried alive. And um, they had to smash the windows in the place to throw the stuff out onto the street, um, eventually demolishing the building because it was so filthy. So that sort of level of accumulation, which you briefly saw in a clip that I ran there, I stopped it because I got a copyright notice actually on the uh, streaming. Um, apparently... Uh, that was the only thing I got a copyright notice on. It indicates that you are to cease and desist with the streaming of that particular item, otherwise they'll terminate your uh, your stream. So that that's why I'm very punctilious with music generally. Not because I'm worried about playing music over ham radio, because that's no longer illegal under the definitions of the present Radio Communications Act, but because it will excite the copyright bots on YouTube and potentially cause the termination of possibly the YouTube stream or possibly the entire account. So you have to be careful. So John, um, did it inspire you to get rid of some of the equipment as it has inspired me? VK3EWG and the group VK3AML. Yes, 3AML, VK3, GG, there are some things on the list to move on, but I have moved on a few things anyway. But uh, yes, um, yes, talking about the thing about microphones, well, I remember a certain Daryl had uh, toilets flushing on 3CR and a few other things, um, uh, because yeah, when he used to do his docs about things, so yes, that was quite amusing. Um, yes, it's all very interesting, yes. Um, it's all working quite nice. I wonder if Andrew Wright's actually listening tonight because last week when we did the test, the uh, I later found that the uh, cat had walked on a switch and the power amplifier wasn't working, so it's working tonight. And uh, yes, so uh, um, we, we should have more power this week than the other week. Okay, yeah, um, I'm just I've been looking at the um statistics of the numbers watching this program uh, they started at six they shot up within 10 minutes to 20 and peaked at 24 at about 10 50 p.m uh, dipped somewhat during the uh, final psychologist's analysis i don't think too many people were too interested in that and they've uh, jumped up back to about uh, 15 now so quite a few people do do watch on the stream. And incidentally, if anybody's listening on uh, 475 to us here um, and wants to look in on this, not that you'll see much apart from an old bloke with a white beard and a pair of headphones on, um, you can dial up VK3AML15 January 2022 in Google. That is Google the phrase VK3AML15 January 2022 and you should get the video that goes with this audio. Also, if you have trouble with receiving any one of us, uh, AML, ACZ, EGG, BLX or ECG, uh, it might be worth your while to listen through the stream, the YouTube stream, as I'm streaming all the audio through there as well. So now we go round to Peter, VK3ACZ. How's your week been, Peter? Have you been hiding from the heat? 
Oh, I should mention while you're all there too, uh, 26th of January, Wednesday the 26th, at Columbia Park Wheelers Hill, that's Australia Day, Columbia Park at Wheelers Hill, uh, VK3FTOM, Tom has organised a ham radio field day confab, so if you'd like to get together with some chaps and some gear, I'll be there with a tablet computer and this VHF transmitter to do some slow scan TV, a digital slow scan across to Terry on the other side of the bay, transmitting pictures that we take on the day. Um, you'd be very welcome to come along. That's the 26th of January 2022, Australia Day, Columbia Park, Wheelers Hill. I'll hand it over to you, Peter, VK3ACZ and group VK3AML. Yeah, VK3AML and the group VK3ACZ. Good evening, Chris, John, Dave and John. Uh, all good signals here at my QDH. Uh, lots of red jelly beans on the gas meter. And, um, uh, yeah, first thing about... I spoke to F-Tom uh, this afternoon on the uh, VHF UHF Field Day contest and told him that I'd be a definite starter for that one. So look for, looking forward to it. Um, and I almost feel like giving you a number there, uh, Chris, because not that I did a lot of uh, contesting today, uh, far from it. I just handed out a few numbers to the stations that were further away, like uh, Ralph uh, WRE uh, there on Mount Tassie and uh, three DAE on Mount Dore and, uh, you know, around about 120 k's each, which I like to do on um, uh, 2 and 70. A uh, quick comment today, or a couple of comments today. First, uh, you mentioned the audio on your microphone. I actually uh, really like it. To my calibrated eardrum, it seems to be less trebly than the one I'm normally hearing you on, and I like your audio a lot. I know that's very subjective and everybody's got their own ideas, but uh, I wouldn't want you to change a thing. And uh, your mention of the lapel microphone and, and uh, going to the ablutions block afterwards, uh, Simpsons might be way ahead of you, Dave, because there's an episode there where Homer and Marge were uh, ended up speaking at a conference and then uh, went away to go intimate and forgot to switch off their lapel microphone, so everybody in the, um, the hall were hearing the two of them <laughs> had it. Anyway, enough of that, silly. Uh, Chris, um, that Germanic accent guy, did he drop the F-bomb, the very last thing he said? It certainly sounded like it, <laughs> but I wasn't sure. Oh, no, on the subject of hoarding, I guess we've all got our horror stories. Uh, one, for me, concerns a ham that I went to see, and, and I got an awful shock, but it wasn't the fact that it was very hard to walk through the place because the the corridors and everything were, were piled up with junk so that there was barely room for you to walk through sideways. Uh, what, what scared me the most were things like maggots in the sink, uh, mould growing up the walls from the, the kitchen bin. And when they say things like, oh, let me make you a cup of coffee, you think, oh, no, no, because you, you know, this guy's got an immune system that obviously can handle this, but it would probably kill me for sure. So, yeah, it's, uh, my concern's more for the... Um, the health aspects than, you know, because if they're happy living in a house that that's cluttered, although it's impossible for me to imagine, uh, you know, who am I to say? <laughs> Having said that, uh, I uh, do sometimes volunteer at a, um, a soup kitchen that provides meals for the less fortunate and uh, uh, people in uh, real unfortunate circumstances. And, and there's one lady who turns up there in her car and I don't know how she gets into it. There is absolutely no space between floor and ceiling uh, all around her. Um, yeah, there's barely room for her. She obviously only sees through one rear mirror, uh, certainly not the one um, in, uh, inside the ceiling of the car because it's you no know, floor to ceiling. Uh, amazed that she hasn't been put off the road yet, but I suppose that'll come eventually. But, uh, yeah, it's an awful thing, and thanks for the broadcast tonight that highlighted it. And uh, for what it's worth, I, I must have been the one that was actually enjoying that uh, psychologist report that uh, must have uh, abridged the copyright. Uh, I, I thought that was uh, really the most informative one of the lot. But anyway, so thank you for the broadcast. I did call in um, uh, as soon as you dropped the mic originally. I must have been um, knocked out in a, in a pile-up or something, but I've been listening from the very start. All good there. Back to you, uh, Chris, VK3AML on the group, VK3ACZ. VK3ACZ and the group, VK3AML. Well, when I put it over to uh, the radio, I have to make a quick change. Um, normally, 
when I'm actually transmitting the pre-recorded sections of the broadcast, I'm listening off air, off a, a scanner receiver, an old realistic scanner, it's quite good enough for that. And um, then when I go over to the, the other radio, the uh, transceiver, I have to pull the microphone, uh, sorry, pull the headphones out of the off-air monitor and shove them into the mixer so that I can hear people uh, on the transceiver that are being put through the mixer. And um, frequently when doing that, particularly this week with the new arrangement with the peak limiter, um, I hadn't switched the right channel on the mixer so there was dead silence through the stream and into my headphones for the first few seconds. Uh, apologies to the people on the stream and to the people I might have missed. Uh, I might uh, give a pause before handing it back to John BLX just to see if anybody else is with us. Um, yeah, so the audio should be at a more optimum level both for the stream and for this transmission tonight. Um, I now understand why Tony 3AML was so enthusiastic about uh, uh, peak limiter design. Uh, now normally I could get the peak limiter such as the Behringer one I've got off the shelf but like many foodstuffs at the moment um, equipment is actually running short in the stores because of um, delivery problems. The truckies around the country are falling ill just as everybody else is, probably more so because they're exposed to a wider number of places and people. So there are problems with electronic supply at the moment and I've actually got the uh, peak limiter for me on order with a, a DJ place in Richmond and hopefully we'll get it within two or three weeks but normally I could get it you know, just off the shelf. wonder if anybody else has uh, seen shortages of equipment that they're after, electronic or otherwise. VK3BLX, back to the top of the group, with a pause for anybody else who'd like to break in. VK3AML. VK3AML on the group, VK3BLX, nothing, nothing heard here, no new breakers. Uh, yeah, well, uh, one thing I've noticed shortage of is uh, lots of things on the shelves in Woolworth, um, especially uh, the meat section. I just went in there the other day and it was just about totally bare. It's the, the, the shop in Bourne. But um, it's just quiet in that uh, other transceiver down. Um, <clears throat> somebody put us onto a, one of the um, alternate. Uh, small grocery chains and we went down there and they had a beautiful selection of meat so obviously uh, his uh, meat supply system is working just fine. Uh, I meant to mention um, too Chris that I watched you on the big screen in the lounge room tonight. I, I was in there for uh, until you mentioned that you were going to take calls back and I came in here then so it uh, looked very very good on the big screen. Um, and in fact, uh, it was sufficiently large and clear that I was able to note the kind of microphone that the ham uh, hoarder, if you could call him that, was using. It was an Australian microphone, a Rode, so probably, or well, possibly he's in Australia, who knows? I don't know whether Rhodes are sold widely all around the world, maybe they are. Uh, talking about uh, hot mics, what about the hot mics uh, recently on the, the Channel 7 news anchors and their... Uh, candid uh, um, their candid thoughts on a certain tennis player that was rather hilarious um, one other thing I noted down here is the section on the, the guy who's collecting old PCs I think there might be a lot of those around I have occasionally kept an eye on a Facebook group uh, which looks at vintage <coughs> excuse me, vintage computers and the number of people getting excited about you know, picking up these old 486 machines and even earlier, oh, so they can play some ancient game or what have you, and uh, all these ancient cards and all the rest of it. And luckily, it doesn't uh, interest me, although I must say I have got a few PCs kicking around the place, <laughs> some of which do, in fact, or a couple of which do work, and I've used them for some old software that uh, probably wouldn't run on Windows 10. 
but uh, nothing like the collections that these people seem to accumulate. Uh, the guy in the uh, YouTube video, uh, he obviously uh, put a good part of his uh, downstairs, <coughs> it was his basement or whatever, but a good section of that part of his house is well and truly full, so uh, what he plans to do with them, I don't know. <laughs> the K3AML in the group, the K3BLX. Yeah, well, apart from from the point of view of a person in their 20s or early 30s, the nostalgia that they might have for early computer games on 5-inch floppies or 3.5-inch or whatever they were, um, I don't see the attraction personally. Um, CRT monitors, I suppose, would be a, a real novelty for young people who are used to flat screens. Um, Somebody who's less than, let's say, 25 years old probably would would have seen very few CRT monitors or TV sets in their in their time. So to them, um, CRT monitors are probably what regenerative receivers are to you or I. In our generation, they were something from the 30s that was fascinating to operate, but uh, you know, very simple but um, capable of good performance if they if you were prepared to fiddle with the regeneration control and put up with the variations of hand to capacity near the tuned circuit and you know get it just on the verge of oscillating um, all of that uh, very few people I think even in our generation unless they home build stuff would know the pleasure of operating one of those um, the, the meat, interesting, um, Woolworths and um, Coles seem to be running very, very short on meat. And I tell you what, the specialist meat places, the places that sell the special marinades and the shop fronts where they are a cut above, literally, um, the supermarkets, seem to be doing a roaring trade. They have, the, the, the high priced priced meat places have no trouble with stock. So I wonder why. I mean, it, it's it's a boon for those specialist meat shops. I saw in Mont Albert the other day there's a high-class meat place where you pay about twice as much for the cuts, but you are assured that they will be high-quality cuts because he probably rejects a lot. Those places have no shortage of supply at all. Glad to hear that the 1080p is working well, by the way. Um, my webcam is no great shakes, it's just a standard um, modern uh, Logitech webcam. Runs no higher than 1080, but then YouTube live stream doesn't run any higher than 1080 at the moment. I don't think there's facility to run it at 4K. I do have some 4K camera sources, but not the, the webcam. Uh, but 1080 is is fairly pleasing. One of the things I have to do before I run the video clips each week is to make sure that all the clips are converted to 1080p before I play them because if I mix 320 and 240 and 720p clips with the 1080p clips they occupy only a part of the screen. It, I think it's one of the deficiencies of the OBS software or perhaps I haven't found the the right tab yet to bring them all to the same size but as a result of that I, I do quite a bit of order, audio filtering also on the audio of various clips because um, in general the ones that have been transferred from VHS tapes are hugely lacking in any high frequencies above 1k some of them are very muffled uh, the, uh, the clip of um, Julie Kentwell for example uh, had a real roll-off problem on it, so I, I did some um, graphic equaliser um, fast Fourier changes to those clips before they went to air. Anyway, it's been interesting to see how the new arrangement, both video and audio, has gone this time. VK3 ECG and the group VK... And have you noticed, uh, th uh, Dave, 3 ECG, that the specialist meat shops are not short of product at all. VK3 ECG and group VK3 AML. Yeah, VK3 AML and the group VK3 ECG. Yes, I, I went to the supermarket today and yes, was quite disappointed, not just some of the meat sections, but uh, 
um, a few other interesting areas. There was, <laughs> there was a very nice cartoon appeared, uh, not cartoon, a photograph appeared somewhere. It might have been on Facebook or something where it showed a, a whole line of a shelf and there was one zone of the shelf was fully packed out with food and everything else was empty and that was the tofu section in the meat section that was uh, um, well stocked. Um, um, not that I necessarily disagree, I don't have a particular problem with tofu, not that I have it that often. Um, but um, I thought it was rather, rather, rather a telling cartoon, which I thought was rather nice. Um, and the other one I quite liked recently was the um, uh, was the one about rat tests and uh, that related to uh, uh, people talking about the symptoms of COVID, saying one of the first things you use is your smell. So I poured a glass of wine and had a good sniff, and and then the next thing you lose is your taste. So I tasted that, and uh, so I did the test about 19 times. But you know, the next morning I felt really quite bad, and and I thought well, I better have to try another few tests as well. So, which I thought was quite a nice a nice take on the rat test shortage, which is of a of, of, a, of a similar order. But yes, that was really quite interesting. Uh, the, the really quite interesting sporadic gaps in the shells in, in key areas, not just, not just in meat, but uh, in other, um, and some of them sort of, sort of dry groceries as well were missing in some areas. And I think there's been a bit of difference between some of the supermarkets. I suspect it's just their particular supply chain and whether the particular warehouse or those particular drivers have been affected um, you know, at, a, at a particular time. Um, yes, I was going to talk about the, the copyright bots. It's interesting, as my, uh, as you know, my wife does a lot of stuff with uh, early music and uh, and early dance and so on. And there's all these um, bots going around now, you know, accusing people of copyright things. And and, and uh, so the last one she had, which she refused to take the video down, and they uh, and appealed against the decision on the basis that this music the person claimed had copyright was was written in, uh, I think, 1510 or something like that and was played by their own uh, performers on their own recording and therefore could hardly be claimed to be within copyright. Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, and she won that one. So uh, um, I think uh, there's quite a few of these doing the rounds, trying to just get in where they can and claim various things. Um, but uh, it, it, it's certainly interesting. You know, I was quite amused to see myself at the uh, EM, uh, uh, at the car boot sale or whatever uh, for EMDLC, and uh, yes, I was chatting away there to uh, Morris Adele, one of my colleagues um, um, for K3DR, and um, uh, he was uh, he was he was there. And I think that was probably the last one that was held. Was it? Was the one? I can't remember now. I, I think it. Was. Um, but yes, I think um, it, we had actually met Chris before that at, at one of um, uh, at one of Steve's um, uh, film night things. I think you know quite a few years ago. But um, um, I just didn't know you then. But uh, yes, yes, I've personally picked quite a few old things, uh, those things, and then have um, returned them to be sold on in due course elsewhere because I've never used them, never touched them never done anything with them. Um, I'm not too bad, but uh, certainly um, I've got a few things here that I desperately should be getting getting rid of. I think at some time we'll have to um, get a group together just to have our own stall. I've got, I don't have enough for a stall, um, certainly not, but um, I probably could um, occupy a couple of feet on someone's stall if, it was, if, it was a, if there was a little group cluster of people, and I think people do that from time to time. Anyway, back to you, Chris. VK3 AML and Group VK3 ECG. VK3 ECG and Group VK3 AML, yeah. Um, with the copyright bot, uh, the com several composers are difficult. Several composers' output I is difficult. One is the 1920s composer, Walter Donaldson. And whenever I've tried to put up something, even on a 78 made in 1925 of Walter Donaldson's, it has been muted by YouTube. So there must be some basic problem with the, com with the, the rights holder for anything by Walter Donaldson. I'm told by people who know also anything by Gershwin is questionable, particularly if it's recorded by a major company, even if the recording is from the pre-electric era before 1925. Um, the problem is not with George Gershwin. 
who died in 1937 and therefore... I think under most circumstances would be considered out of copyright. The problem was with Ira Gershwin, his brother, who, as we all know, did the lyrics of a lot of the Gershwin popular music material. And Ira Gershwin died in 1984, which provides a little bit more of a copyright problem. And uh, purposely, apparently, George and Ira Gershwin, brother and the two brothers, uh, when they published their stuff, they never specified that one wrote the music and one wrote the lyrics purposely to increase the chance of copyright. They were canny um, way back then. And I remember the film night. I think I was briefly introduced, Dave, but I wouldn't have connected you with ham radio at that stage. It's, when you first meet people, it takes a while for it to sink in, or at least for a thick head like me it does. Uh, <laughs> but um, noted your presence on that video. I hadn't looked closely on it since I shot it. Um, it was shot at the... I think you're right, too. It was the last ham fest of the EMDRC before they started cancelling them. Um, now, Jared Quinn uh, talking to me on um, the text chat says, I think uh, with the varying the... Uh, 320p clips with others on OBS software. He said he thinks it's a scale issue when you start having huge numbers. Oh, wait a minute, this is for the transport. He thinks it's a scale issue with regard to uh, the Safeway meat versus the small shop meat. When you start having huge numbers off sick, you redeploy folks from non-core businesses like meat packaging. While a high street butcher has to make the core business work, it's just not worth it. Oh, and with YouTube, um, uh, even the, the library, I have full written rights for... Uh, I'm just... I won't go into the other copyright stuff that Jared talks about. It's lovely to have you on the stream, Jared. I've seen you there several times, and uh, thanks for making your presence felt. Likewise, Jeff Sylvester, who's a fairly constant viewer. Um, uh, and he says that hoarding is a subject close to his heart. I'm glad to see that he admits it. Um, and Ian Foster, uh, 3ST, also has been watching. Quite a few people actually on the on the stream tonight, which is great. There's still a dozen of them at this late hour. So with that, um, we go through to John VK3 Double G um, for your comments, have you had any trouble with meat supply up there in Upway? VK3, Double G, and uh, the group VK3 AML. 3 AML, VK3, GG. Uh, no, not really. Um, actually, I know that some of the pictures of the supermarkets on TV where all the shelves are empty, and OK, there are gaps in the ones in Fairtree Gully and that, but it, it doesn't look as bad out here as some of the things they showed on the news. Um, so, uh, um that, that was my impression. But basically I've been able to get what I want. Yes, uh, uh, <coughs> super regenerative receivers. Well, I had a... <coughs> I built quite a few of them, uh, oh, I suppose it would be 50 years ago now or more. Um, and uh, I even had a, a radio-controlled model aeroplane uh, with a homemade receiver and that was also super regenerative because they were the go in the 60s. Um, but uh, I haven't really bothered lately with that sort of thing. Um, in fact, uh, nowadays it's just as easy to make a, um, a, a super head anyway, just about, with some of the things you can get. Whereas back then, you know, trying to make something with a, a triad valve you got from disposals or something, well, it sort of limited you, didn't it? Um, yes, and... Uh, um, <clears throat> yes, well, Andrew likes to collect old computers. In fact, there's a couple more of them that might be going his way here. Because um, I'm thinking about whether I'm going to do anything with them or not, and I'm probably not. But, uh, yeah, um, what else was I going to say? Well, yeah, that's the other thing uh, why I was uh, thinking originally to have a missions with ATV. I know um, you made a comment that perhaps people mightn't like the lesser resolution of 625 line TV, but... Uh, when I said that to Mr. Coombs and a few other people, he said, well, they'd rather watch a thing that's 625 line and doesn't keep getting pulled down by copyright bots 
than watch something in higher res and only see half of it. So uh, there's arguments for and against that. And uh, so uh, that was originally what I was going to try doing until various things happened. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I guess those meat suppliers, so there's a, a big one on the corner of uh, Scoresby Road and uh, Baroni Road. I haven't looked in there, but I imagine that will probably still be all nicely stocked up as well. Um, and uh, like the other fellow said, yes, well, you've got to make the business work. And I suppose if you're a, uh, um, a strip shopping centre greengrocer, well, you would still have to go to Vic Market and get all your vegetables and things, all your um, greengrocer would stop working, whereas a supermarket probably doesn't have that same problem. They can still limp along with areas of stock missing, much more so than the uh, specialist butcher or the greengrocer could. VK3 EGG buy. Sorry about the delay. I was um, listening off a speaker to you, John, <laughs> and try, <laughs> trying to get a slash done before you finished, because I, I, I can, you know, the toilet's just in there. Oh dear, this is what happens when you drink lots of branch-style coffee out of a branch-style cup through the night. Um, I've got one of the branches, oh, pardon me, old gold Pyrex. What do they call them? Um, I can't quite turn it upside down to have a look, but uh, um, that's been souvenired from the remains of Park Street in days of yore. Um, as for ATV versus YouTube live stream, yes, I've I've tossed up the possibilities of ATV, but the problem is um, there are maybe 25 people capable of looking in at ATV. Uh, and you have to be close enough to line of sight to Mount View, uh, the police academy, to do it. Um, whereas with YouTube live stream, it goes worldwide, not quite instantaneously, but within 30 seconds. And quite a few of my viewers are interstate. One or two are in Britain, one or two are in America. Um, although to watch in America you have to get up fairly early in the morning like about six o'clock um, to see this but I do know that um, uh, the, the great advantage of YouTube live stream from my point of view is that once it's recorded it stays up and it can be watched by people through the week and usually I find that the split of people watching live and people watching the recorded stream afterwards is about two to the replay to one for people watching it live so twice the number of people watch replays watch it live um, so from that point of view uh, in view of the limited range of ATV in view of the standard definition um, and I don't want to put a particular emphasis on music, that's not really my thing, that's more Steve 3SL's thing. Um, YouTube Live is, is perfectly adequate. In fact, I probably have a lot more people watching there than, um, than listening on the air or, uh, or indeed that I could ever possibly access through ATV. Marvellous though the new repeater is, uh, it only, because of its UHF nature, only uh, services a very limited area of very limited viewership. Um, and the other problem with ATV is that uh, even if you get um, an old um, set-top box to convert uh, the ATV frequencies to what you can receive on your TV receiver, there are not a great proportion of the number of set-top boxes that can actually tune that I have here about four on the shelf, which I will be getting rid of, and none of them can tune the ATV repeater, unfortunately, even if you manually intervene in the programming. So yes, I've looked into ATV, but I've rejected the idea. Too expensive um, and not sufficient number of people watching for me to be really interested. I get 
Uh, at its peak tonight, I had 24 people watching, and I doubt whether there are that many people with equipment to receive ATV in Melbourne. Um, so with that, on to VK3ACZ, Peter. Um, just trying to think if there was anything I was commenting on on you, Peter. I don't think there is. Would there be any chance, Peter, in, in hitching a lift to Columbia Park if you're going there on Australia Day, per chance? Um, sorry to put that one on you publicly, but um, there might be a chance. My normal lift, uh, Chris VK3CJN, has dropped out for the day. Uh, and it would save me a bus journey. Uh, I don't mind travelling with one other person, but getting onto a bus with uh, the number of infections of COVID at the moment, I think, is dangerous. VK3ACZ and group VK3AML. VK3AML and the group VK3ACZ. Uh, no drama. Uh, consider it done. Just uh, when you uh, have your reply over, it, just tell me what time you want to be picked up and uh, that will be done. All good. And uh, here are you guys getting all concerned about supermarket shelves with meat disappearing and, and food and other non-essentials like that. Get real, guys. Be concerned about the sort of stuff I heard today. Hi, hi. Uh, talking with uh, Ross from the toy shop. Now, we all know he's uh, closed until the 27th, but he said he was supposed to get a Yesu delivery during the week and uh, no drivers. And uh, <laughs> he thinks it'll still be another few weeks. And, of course, I was hoping to pick up a radio when he opened. So, to me, that's the real crisis. But, no, seriously, uh, well, almost seriously, um, I can understand why people are off crook at the moment because uh, this week I was infected with the um, Moderna virus. Now, before you and especially Dr Dave say that uh, I've got that back to front, no, I haven't. Uh, Omicron can't be as bad as uh, what I experienced within 24 hours of getting the booster jab. It, for me, was awful. Please don't uh, anybody think that I'm trying to discourage you from having the booster yourself. It just uh, it was pretty awful for a while. Uh, thumping head, uh, febrile, you know, aches, uh, <laughs> dizziness. Yeah, it was all there. I, I was miserable for a while there. As I said, I just wondered whether Omicron could be as bad. But there you go. Hopefully it's uh, cheap insurance. But anyway, oh, one other thing I'd like to relate on a totally different subject that uh, occurred uh, early in the week. Last Monday, Chris, there was some magnificent tropo again with VK7, which was odd because the... Uh, the weather map didn't seem to show the high pressure zone that you normally come to expect with uh, Tropo down to VK7, but I made another one of Peter Parker's YouTube videos. Uh, this time uh, a snippet of the chat I had with him occurred. Now, whilst he was strength five um, on two metres um, direct to me, I ended up speaking to him via the link system in Tasmania. Uh, I went down and back on a 70 centimetre repeater and he went there and back on a 2 metre repeater. I couldn't hear the 2 metres but uh, the uh, 70 centimetre one was coming through beautifully for me. Uh, magnificent stuff. Uh, since sporadic E on 10 and 6 metres has been uh, not as good as last year, it's been nice to have two uh, really good uh, tropo events uh, so far this year. But anyway, that's my little story. Um, back to you, Chris. VK3 AML in the group, VK3 ACZ. Just left a brief pause there, VK3 ACZ and the group, VK3 AML. Well, I had my booster, the Pfizer booster, yesterday, and I honestly can say that I barely noticed it. Um, no itchiness, no effect, no headaches, nothing. No. I think I got more of an effect by walking from the clinic to the car in the sun than I did from the booster shot. Um, I, my first two shots were AstraZeneca back in September and the booster came yesterday and it was Pfizer. But nothing, no problem, no problem. And um, the openings to VK7, are they not predicted by the Hepburn charts or are, they, are the Hepburn charts predicting something else? I... I imagine some of these adiabatic effects over the horizon, ducting, uh, are, are very temporary, like only a few hours at dawn and dusk, and uh, maybe they don't get predicted. I don't know. Um, while, I've, uh, <laughs> while I've got you there, um, I, I wonder how everybody feels about Novak Djokovic. 
uh, and declaring war on Serbia. Maybe we should <laughs> maybe we should send a, a warship to Serbia armed uh, with with the guns armed with tennis balls and start firing tennis balls into Serbia. Uh, personally, I thought. <laughs> Oh, that man. I know it's a storm in a teacup being uh, tennis and all, but <laughs> I just wish he'd go away. <laughs> I think a lot of Australians feel like that too. He's, he, he just hits a ball around the court, you know, take his ball and his racket away and he wouldn't be worth the zack. Um, who do I hand it to now? VK3BLX, if you're still with us, John. VK3AML. VK3 AML on the group VK3 BLX. Oh, yes, good old Novax. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I think he's taken us to bunnies, basically. He's tried to wriggle through a loophole that may or may not exist in the uh, rules around uh, how you might not have to be vaccinated to get into Australia, which is supposed to be a fairly narrow crack for gather, you know, people who are maybe too ill to... Uh, to have a, uh, a vaccination, but anyway, <laughs> time will tell. It's a very interesting little uh, contest between the government and uh, his lawyers at the moment. It's going to be interesting to watch. Um, I mean, there's, there are things that have been reported that haven't really been resolved, or it'd be lovely to know a bit more about what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, that uh, German newspaper, is it uh, Der Spiegel or whatever it is? Um, they reported uh, early in the piece that they'd found apparent discrepancies in the um, uh, the, uh, the COVID tests that he'd undergone, one showing that he'd <coughs> been infected or had it, had an infection, and a week later saying it was cleared. But um, they talked about timestamps and things being a bit strange, but the really curious one was that the serial numbers of the tests, which appear to be, you know, incremented with every one that they processed, uh, were out of order. Um, the, uh, the one where he was supposed to initially be affected was, had, had a much higher uh, serial number than the, uh, the one that had supposed to be done later, and as far as anyone could tell, uh, the system that uh, recorded all these things just uh, incremented the serial number each time. So I haven't heard any more about that, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> you'd have to wonder whether the system of um, providing that information uh, was uh, bulletproof or whether it was subject to uh, a little bit of tinkering. Anyway, that's just one interesting question. Uh, if they have any trouble with their existing approach, I guess they can always go back at his um, immigration form and <laughs> hit him with that, that, quote, innocent error, unquote, <coughs> Colour me very sceptical, I'd have to say. Uh, what else we have? Oh, um, uh, Peter, your um, your reaction to, to the uh, Moderna, that, that was no good. And that's as bad a report as I've heard of people having uh, a reaction. Uh, my wife and I, well, probably three or four weeks ago now, we had our Pfizer booster and we neither of us had any ill effects from that at all. A bit like uh, your experience, Chris, I think. Not even a sore arm. <clears throat> little grandson had his um, his first jab, I think, on the first day that they were able. They had him booked in. And uh, they made a habit of trying to distract the children with lollies and things while they had their jab, but he wasn't having any of that. He wanted to watch it. He watched the needle go in with great interest, so <clears throat> he's got an inquiring mind, I think. Uh, OK, back to you, Chris. VK3 AM on the group, VK3 BLX. Yeah, uh, as I say, no effect of the jab at all. Um, I suppose the only thing I noticed was slight tiredness. Um, I had a bit of a nap when I got home, but that could be an effect of my age, 67. I tend to have naps a lot more now than I used to in my 50s. Um, uh, an innocent error. I'm starting to think that both on the government side and the Djokovic side there's been a lot of stretching of truth and I was not impressed with the way Djokovic was anti-vax and prepared to speak publicly about it 
um, having the doors of Australia open to him when so many travellers that we know, people that are separated from family, have been stopped from coming back to Australia um, and, and somehow the rules have been stretched for Djokovic, but not them. And uh, that, that's the thing that really gripes me. I just think it's, it's a double standard, uh, a double standard in which the uh, amount of revenue from the tennis probably is talking. And it shouldn't. Um, yeah. Uh, I've had a few comments on the live stream. Um, Mark Harrison has said, on top of the other ATV issues, only the very latest set-top boxes can receive the new digital format that they're using, DVB stroke T2 HD. Um, on uh, on the ATV repeater, so th the amount of equipment that you can use to receive it is very limited and not easy to get. Um, in the old days, with uh, analog ATV, virtually any TV set could pick it up, and I think it was on 576 megs, a band that we no longer have, and you could tune it on most AT uh, most uh, normal. Um, manually tunable uh, uh, analog receivers. Not so with the new digital systems being used and every time they improve the digital system to a new standard you have to re-equip which doesn't amuse me at all. I'd rather from that point of view put the money into um, into improving the YouTube stream because it's more universally accessible both as a recording and as a live stream and the uh, <clears throat> the copyright issue doesn't worry me too much because uh, really uh, we should give the copyright people their due and observe the law where we're streaming or, or, or broadcasting um, Chris Baird saying, stop talking about the outside world, goddamn. I'm not quite sure what that relates to. Um, there's potential legal consequences in both Serbia and Spain too, it seems. Um, I believe that uh, Djokovic is not the only tennis player that's in question over the, uh, over the COVID entry. Um, Jared Quinn saying, I had two friends who, one was immunocompromised, another pregnant, only left the house for their vaccine appointment during Delta and caught it. Yes, well, I, I, at my age, I have to be very careful with catching anything like um, the, the lurgy, because uh, in my and Prue's case, it could be fatal at 67. And we mix a lot also with people that are older than ourselves and Prue has an elder sister that's in a uh, supervised com. She has a, a multiple sclerosis problem with her mobility. And so we see her frequently and have to take care of our uh, COVID situation um, before visiting. We usually, uh, we have the $10 um, COVID testing kits here and we don't like to use them too much because they cost so much. I don't think they should cost so much if the government is serious about getting rid of this thing, getting on top of it. Such things I feel should have been provided free, particularly for the people in the working suburbs of the west of Melbourne who are least likely to be able to afford the kits to determine whether they've got it. And a lot of the detections of the COVID virus are coming from the personal protection kits, the uh, personal detection kits involving the, the swab of the nose and the detection. But Dave ECG would know a lot about that. Who do I uh, send to now? I'm not sure. Is it VK3CG, I think, Dave? Are you in line next? VK3AML. Yeah, PK3 AML group, PK3 ECG. Oh, yeah, I, I suppose so. <laughs> I 
I haven't been counting really. Um, but uh, yes, absolutely. I would actually on the. I must admit, I'm not sure whether it's just a pun or irony that um, Djokovic's name is Novak um, for, his, for his first name. But um, uh, I suppose it's probably mere irony. Um, but there, but there we are. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I, I had my, um, uh, had my booster. I think in the first week of December, and had uh, really nothing at all. So I was very lucky. Yeah. Um, but um, my wife had hers last week, and um, again, absolutely nothing. So after just the usual sort of slight sore local tenderness, that was it, and that was gone and very very quickly. Um, my daughter, who um, uh, had Pfizer, and she had uh, was quite unwell after the second one. Um, and um, but I, I, when I say unwell, I mean had a headache, uh, <laughs> um, a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth, but a headache, and um, uh, and was better in, in in 12 hours. So you know, I think that's the the, the the mark of these things. And but obviously there will be variations, and I don't know that you can really pick much between Moderna and Pfizer in that from that regard. They're both the same sort of um, um, vaccine, and then um, obviously they they will have different adjuvants and other things in them as well so you know people may react to some parts of those um, uh, rather than, than the sort of active vaccine uh, agent itself so there's always those sorts of mixtures and people are just different I mean that's the thing I think people forget about the uh, you know biology isn't like other physical sciences a bit like going up into sort of um, microwaves and, 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 and gigahertz frequencies, you can build exactly the same two bits of equipment and they work totally differently. And that's a bit like that with the biology of the human body. Um, there's such an enormous spread in people's own immune systems that really um, lots of people will react to quite differently to the same sort of thing. And uh, within that usual bell curve, I suspect. Um, and so you'll always get a few people who have problems and a few people who have absolutely nothing at all and then a whole group in the middle who has some, you know, very mild sort of, um, um, you know, feeling tired and a bit of malaise and perhaps the odd little headache or something. So there's a huge variation, and you can't tell. Um, we're actually getting a bit better on some things to work out how people do react to different types of um, drugs, and sort of the pharmacogenetic stuff is coming in these days. So we will probably in the future be able to actually predict how people will respond to certain things. But... Um, um, uh, it, we, we're not at quite at that level for, for these sorts of things yet. Um, I read with interest the, um, that I've forgotten the woman's name now, the woman who was advocating those sort of, um, you know, micro dose pathology tests um, uh, for, for diagnosing everything under the sun and um, uh, was uh, eventually convicted in the US for it. I mean, it's not that the technique fundamentally is wrong. But, but she promoted it in a way that was well, well beyond the technology of the day, uh, which is fascinating, I think. Um, yes, I was just looking through my list of things. Um, yes, I'm sorry, I don't have any. I was asked your uh, questions the other day, um, uh, Chris, about pick them, says, I'm afraid not doing sort of um, YouTube stuff. I don't have anything like that in the shack. Um, perhaps I ought to think a bit more about my audio. But on that front, Peter, yes, thank you very much for your comments about the audio. I, I changed over from the sort of little hand mic that I had, the Yesu hand mic, for a, a, a desk mic. I thought, oh, well, I'll plug that in as a dynamic mic and just see how, how that goes. So um, I thought that would be a bit better for um, the sort of radio conversations rather than, than DX. So um, thank you very much for the... Uh, for the audio report. I'm not 100% sure I'll make the um, Australia Day thing. I'd, I'd quite like to get down to Columbia Park and um, all, all things um, being equal, probably will. But I'd just better, better check with the family and make sure that there's no, no other um, arrangement being made. But I have to say that we, like as you were saying, Chris, we've been really um, curtailing our um, travel and going out to things. And if we do, we tend to go out of Melbourne um, into the sort of nearby countryside, um, you know, sort of north and northeast of us, to the wineries and things like that, where it's a lot more quiet and uh, obviously um, you could be outside a lot and eat outside and so on, which is really very nice and, and I think that reduces the, the, the general risks because, yes, you just don't know what the uh, what um, um, things uh, uh, can happen. Yes, I mean, everyone talks about um, Omicron being... Um, 
are less severe, but of, but of course there is still Delta around, and um, that's the other thing that people uh, people um, uh, haven't necessarily cottoned on to. Everyone's talking about Omicron all the time, but that doesn't mean to say Delta's not around, um, uh, although it is obviously being completely superseded by the more infectious agent. And uh, it was interesting, there was a piece in the, uh, one of the... Um, uh, things I was reading online about um, people saying, oh, you know, people appearing in a hospital um, with COVID who've been vaccinated and then someone saying yes, but if you actually look at the details, they've come into hospital for something else and they just happen to have um, COVID when they've had their routine check in hospital. Um, but that's not the reason they're there, um, which in itself is probably a good promotion for all the issues around vaccination. But look, there's just so much um, argy-bargy about it, and I think at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the the strong public health line is obviously something that's been heavily pushed, and and you know, as far as I'm aware, that pretty much the entire medical profession is is, is thoroughly supportive of it. So uh, where does that leave um, the um, the other people without the knowledge base who seem to know a lot more about it? Um, uh, very concerning in many respects. Um, yes, I, I'm just thinking back to the last thing we were talking about car holders, um, uh, uh, Peter. Yes, I mean, I, it, is, it, is, um, it is fascinating. I've seen a couple of them. In fact, I had somebody once roll up at my workplace complaining that they were being, they were being, I don't know what it was now, some, some complaint they had about um, police or something or other, and they rolled up in their car and parked in our car park, and I just could not... Uh, Imagine they could have been drive the vehicle. It was so full to the, But I suspect a lot of these people actually don't drive the vehicle very much. It, uh, it has a very short little trip from time to time rather than being, if you like, um, on the road. They're living in the vehicle probably um, away from the main streets most of the time. Um, that's probably how they, how they cope and remain relatively, yeah, relatively invisible. Anyway, back to you, Chris. Um, VK3 AML on group VK3 ECG. VK3 ECG and the group VK3 AML. Well, with COVID, the, the most immediate impact on my family here is that Prue was due for some major spinal surgery, uh, some very major spinal surgery on the 28th of January, scheduled. And basically it was to put a plate in between two vertebrae in the lumbar back to stretch them apart to stop the... Um, pressure on the spinal cord that she has as a result of a bone spur tendency that affects her back and uh, she's got pain in the left leg and uh, weakness in the left leg and uh, we were gearing ourselves up for the surgery but uh, technically it, although it's fairly severe it was elective surgery and all elective surgery at this stage is off so we've been thrown into um, not quite chaos, but um, certainly completely rethinking it and Prue having gritted her teeth and um, in expectation of the, the pain and all the rest of it for the 28th now has to spend another few months in sad and frightening anticipation, which probably makes the overall effect worse. So that has been put off and uh, we have to grin and bear it, along with anybody else who has elective surgery required at the time. Um, but with 40,000 people being uh, infected a day by this present Omicron virus, even with a tiny proportion dying, I think it's still something in the order of 20 deaths a day. It's appalling. I don't think... Um, people to quite it's quite sunk in yet so that's why I say if I can go with Peter that's fine and Peter and I have been very careful both being of the same age group I think um, to not expose ourselves to other people too much <laughs> not in a sexual way <laughs> um, but um, uh, to take uh, to mind our P's and Q's about um, COVID so going with him in a car is much less risk to me than travelling in a bus. I would, I really fear buses and public transport at the moment. I think that would be a sure way, with 40,000 infections a day, of running a great risk. 
Um, on the subject of predicting diseases of various types, Dave, uh, 3ECG, you may be interested, my brother-in-law is a, a Dr Terry Speed. He's a mathematician currently working for the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute on DNA mapping. And uh, the idea of the DNA mapping is so that they can predict which people with which particular types of DNA are subject to hereditary diseases, uh, cancer of the bowel, cancer of uh, the thyroid, etc., etc., so that they can um, uh, keep a particular watch on those people to catch uh, people with a propinquity for uh, uh, particular types of cancer, keep them under watch so that if anything shows up they can catch it early. And um, it's interesting, Terry, um, involved with DNA mapping, you can imagine the problem that he has with people who don't accept the uh, evolution theory where the whole code of DNA actually gives you the tracing of evolution back to the primordial single cell and it wouldn't work unless there was evolution. Um, sometimes with religious people, particularly with religious fundamentalists, I have the greatest difficulty. Uh, OK, VK3, round to VK3EGG, John. Um, hope you're still with us. VK3, Alpha Mike Lima. Yes, right, VK3GG back again. Yes, OK, yes, well, I suppose we've... Um Novak Djokovic, they could make um, Novak Djokets to sell to anti-vaxxers. That might be a, a good way of making some money out of the whole thing. But yes, the ATV repeater, well, that's a bit stupid. I mean, now in some states, I believe, with their, their ATV repeaters, they've got a thing where you, you can dial up a thing on a DTMF um, keypad or something when you access the repeater to select analog or digital. So what they should have done here was had that, and if they're going to have DVB2, if you want to transmit DVB2, have that on there as well. So you have the choice. But because I'm on a hill here where um, my missions go all the way to Geelong and past Mount Massive and all the rest, I wasn't going to use the ATV repeater anyway. Uh, I was going to do it direct from here. But uh, that's if things had been built. But anyway, um, it's all quite interesting. Um, and then there's some people who who, who tried to say that the uh, the um, um, COVID jabs are actually a uh, a thing that's going to alter our genetics. It'll kill everybody off in uh, five years' time to uh, get the population back to 500,000 or something for the global population. Well, yes, it's all quite interesting. I think that's what some of them say. Anyway, uh, I think that's all I had to say. It's probably about time time for us to go, isn't it? But anyway, VK3, GG, bye. Yeah, 20 minutes past 12. I suppose we better think about uh, starting to wind up. Um, but thank you very much for popping up, everybody. Uh, Dave, John, the two Johns, Peter, uh, and all the people on the text chat. Um, just looking down the list, uh, somebody calling themselves Bullseye, uh, Chris Baird, Jeff Sylvester, 3FTJS, Terry, L2 Repeat, whoever he might be, Mick, Robert Tate, Bob Tate, 3GS, hello Bob, um, chap calling himself Pirate, uh, gosh, there have been a lot of people listening tonight, It's it peaked at 24, the total number of views since 9.30 has been 132, I think that's the best we've ever done, so um, I don't know what we've done to deserve that viewership um, but something seems to have picked up this week it'll be interesting to see how the the replays go this week if that um, slight copyright breach is allowed to slip through usually there's just a warning there um, but I stopped the copyright material going through as soon as the warning arrived and I think under those circumstances it becomes fair dealing for an extract over to Peter, VK3ACZ, and thank you for the offer of the lift, Peter, even if I had to <laughs> ask to get it. It's very much appreciated, uh, and uh, 
I will make a point of checking myself with a, uh, a uh, COVID testing kit before I get into your car or the same morning or whatever. VK3ACZ and Group VK3 Alpha Mike Lima. Anyway, I might say evening, so uh, um, um, I'll catch you all later on. All the best, John. Yes, 73 John. VK3 AML in the group, VK3 ACZ. And my, my last word about uh, the vaccination is that uh, I appreciate what Dave said about the individual differences because I'd uh, absolutely convinced myself I was sure that any uh, reaction would be uh, psychosomatic and therefore I, I wasn't going to have a problem with it. However, when that man inside my head started using the jackhammer to try to drill his way out of the head and when that other guy in there was jumping around with big army boots and smashing two cymbals together, uh, I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> so there you go. And uh, my uh, only comment about the Novax uh, Djokovic saga is that uh, I'm a bit bemused at the fact that he can get judges to turn up on a Sunday morning uh, yeah, right. I'm sure you and I would have that luxury, wouldn't we? Yeah, perhaps not. Uh, but there you go. Uh, rank has its privileges. I remember a young lady who was, uh, and I don't remember which Olympic Games, but uh, an Australian uh, rifle shooter felt that she'd been given a, a raw deal and should have qualified for the Games. And so she appealed the Australian Olympic Committee's uh, decision and was... Uh, they slated a court case for three months after the Olympics, so that sort of shut her up a little bit. But anyway, it um, be interesting to see how it finishes. And a quick question for John uh, BLX, if you're still there. You mentioned in an earlier over some embarrassment with newsreaders saying something that wasn't meant to go to air. Didn't hear what it was. Just wondering if you can elaborate. That would be good. And uh, one more thing, Chris, what time uh, pick you up on Australia Day? Uh, VK3 AML in the group, VK3 ACZ. I'm not sure exactly when, but I think last time it was around 10 o'clock um, to get there by just before lunch. And from memory, we were there until about 2 in the afternoon. Um, Peter, does that sound like the same arrangement to you? Yeah, yeah. Well, if, if it's starting at 10, I'll pick you up at half 9, or, or do you want me to pick you up at 10? Whatever suits you, I'll fit in completely. I, I don't see any need to get there absolutely on the dot. I don't want to get there too late, but um, uh, enough time just to set up. Now, any time that suits you, Pete. Half nine, then. 9.30, I'll just make a note of that. 9.30, January 26, and if anything else comes up with Prue or whatever before then, I'll contact you via email. OK, over to John, um, and I'm curious about the, the newsreaders that had the microphone open as well. John, I, I hadn't heard that one. Um, obviously you did. VK3BLX, if you're there, John. VK3AML. VK3AML on the group. VK3BLX. <clears throat> oh, yes, this happened uh, last week. Um, uh, who are they? Mike Amor and Rebecca Madden were the two people there. I think they're, they're sort of primary news readers. And uh, they were sitting at the news desk uh, before 6 o'clock, just sort of chatting while they waited for... Uh, six o'clock to come round and their news broadcast to begin and they were chatting about Djokovic and they were chatting about him in the most unflattering terms <coughs> basically uh, saying that they thought he was a uh, an A uh, asterisk asterisk uh, hole if you know what I mean and uh, a liar and god knows what else they were saying uh, and this stream was hijacked if you like copied by someone and uh, released on Facebook or somewhere. Um, and, of course, it went viral. <laughs> Very appropriate, I suppose. Uh, and you can see it for yourself if you just Google um, Djokovic hot mic. That'll get you, uh, uh, get you to one of the many uh, copies of it. Uh, of course, Channel 7 were, you know, blue in the face over it. They were really upset that this had gone out. Well, so they say. <laughs> they probably were, but... The public reaction was uh, uh, very much uh, with the newsreaders. They basically, you know, the comments were like, well, finally someone to say what we all think. Um, and they think they eventually tracked it down to somebody in a, um, a closed captioning uh, company. They outsource all this stuff these days, apparently. So there's sort of live streams going out to these companies who add the captions and do this and that. And some 
naughty soul there uh, took a copy of this and spread around, of course. Uh, they're probably in a lot of trouble. But it makes uh, sort of interesting viewing, and, of course, this uh, got a mention all over the world. I, I went looking just out of curiosity to see where it's popping up. Well, it's popping up on the British news services and the American news services, so it, it really went, went everywhere. Quite hilarious, I reckon. <laughs> Uh, right, a couple of other comments I had. Um, yeah, bad luck about your wife's surgery. And all thanks, well, not all thanks, but largely thanks to all these idiotic, unvaccinated fools who are taking up uh, beds in hospitals now and busily spreading the virus around unnecessarily. Uh, as far as equipment for uh, amateur TV, uh, there are some um, set-top boxes around, not very expensive, which uh, will happily handle DVB-T2, that's pretty common of course now, but as you mentioned Chris, the trick is to get ones that are tunable. Um, I know the local manufacturer Strong uh, makes uh, ones that are, or certainly did, um, and there are other ones on eBay which are also quite suitable that uh, the guys on the ATV group have mentioned, so uh, you know, the information's there. Whether they're all available at the moment with the various shortages and that, I don't know, but uh, generally speaking, you've probably got to pay 50 to 60 70 dollars or something like that, and that gets you uh, one that'll do the trick. So receiving's not really that big a problem. You might need to build up an antenna and stick it up, although where I am here in Motel, but which is a pretty good location, I get a very strong signal just on a vertical, um, <coughs> 70 centimetre vertical, even though I've got a a little Yagi built up. It turned out I you know, get, get, could get by without it if I wanted to. OK, I think that'll do me, and I might make this my final two, guys, because I want to hit the sack. It's half past 12. It's late enough. So um, a very pleasant evening again, very interesting, and uh, look forward to the next one. BK3 AML on the group, BK3 BLX. Cheers, everyone. Yeah, cheers, John, and thanks for coming on. Um, and uh, I wasn't aware that a 70 centimetre vertical could pick it up. I, uh, the uh, Diamond X 7000s I, I have here, I think, has 12 dB gain all around uh, on 70 centimetres. It's about 5.4 metres long, and it's sitting on top of an 11 metre tall mast. And from here, it's only about three to four kilometres to Mount View, and I believe that from my antenna, it's line of sight. So I'd say that the signal would be pouring in. It's just a matter of the terminal equipment. I might maybe even borrow a, a, a set-top box to have a look at what they do. Um, so far, the only way I've been able to look in on the ATV repeater activity is to dial it up on the BATC, the British Amateur Television Club website, with a lot of latency and uh, the sound not too good. And uh, compared with YouTube live stream, frankly, I haven't been too impressed with the quality. I think it's 720p. It's high def, but it's not very high def. And most people lose quite a bit in the transmission. Um, uh, it, I see YouTube um, as the uh, adjunct to ham radio for people who are either not equipped with ham radio equipment or are too far away from me to get the two metre component and we get a lot of feedback from people who are interstate, overseas, that they find it interesting. Um, some weeks more than others. Um, some weeks I have stuff that's of general interest, some weeks I transmit stuff that's of more specific interest to people who are interested in Bass Strait Islands, optical communication. So it will vary. Um, when the COVID restrictions finally come off, I would like to get out and interview a few people, um, including the people I'm talking to now, um, about their background in ham radio. In fact, I might do that a little bit at the 26th of January gathering at uh, Columbia Park. Uh, the fact that the Columbia Park gathering will be out in the open with probably plenty of uh, social distancing um, means that uh, actually being there in that sort of a context would be much less risky than being in any sort of enclosed space. It's quite a healthy area. There's plenty of uh, uh, shade from trees there. And uh, if you take along a collapsible chair and a plastic table, 
you're home and hosed, really. Um, so uh, it's a good sort of a activity to aim at. Um, so Dave, uh, final from you perhaps, VK3CG, and I see it's just ticked over. I've been three hours on the stream, so the stream will be three hours long worth of um, um, uh, UHD. VK3CG and group VK3AML, three hours worth of 1080. Return, yes. um, yeah, look, it, it's been uh, great tonight. I mean, the the um, the pictures being being good. As I said, I've not seen any delays or any uh, any gaps or any uh, breaks in audio. The audio has been excellent. Um, the the uh, high definition has been fine, and I've only got a, a sort of a, um, a sort of Wi-Fi link back to my my modem here up in the shack because that's everything. All my um, internet stuff is downstairs and running a hard um, Ethernet wire up here would be. Um, I could do it, I suppose, but it would just be um, uh, a, a bit of a task. And to be honest, I don't really um, have the need for that sort of direct speed on what I use my sort of shack computer for upstairs. So. Um, uh, it's not really an issue. Yes, um, it, it's very, very annoying about the the um, elective surgery. I know, um, and that's not an uncomfortable. It's not a nice thing to have. I've had two disc prolapses, and uh, with a one stage uh, about a year and a half of really very nasty sciatica um, and inability to sleep, and, and so on. So I know exactly what that is like, and it is extremely unpleasant and just wearing. It's exhausting that sort of um, chronic pain. So you have um, to approach it as my sympathy and um, hopefully well, things will get back to um, uh, a time when the, this can be done a lot more easily. Fortunately, these sort of things are much more straightforward nowadays than they used to be even, you know, five, ten years ago. So um, um, it's, a, it's a fairly, these are very common sort of procedures these days. and. Um, you know, evaluating um, the need for them is something people do all the time. Um, so uh, hopefully that'll that'll get sorted out uh, as as quickly as possible. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the bone spurs are more problematic than the um, than some of the disc ones because the disc ones do tend to settle down after a time. You just have to put up with it. Um, unfortunately, uh, the sort of standard painkillers don't really help with the, the nerve pain and. Um, so it's uh, they're just not that effective, and um, uh, which is which is very very unfortunate. But my sympathies. Um, look, hopefully see you at the Columbia Park thing, and um, uh, I just I'll be checking. But if there's any 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 problems with lifts and so on, happy to help out as well if it comes to the crunch. Okay, uh, seven to three, everyone. Great to uh, chat to you, Peter and John and John again and um, look forward to it uh, uh, another another Saturday. All the best then from VK3 Echo Charlie Golf. Uh, Chris, one more thing from me. Yeah, sure John. The, uh, D, uh, the amateur TV repeater is now 1080p and uh, quality is you know very good given decent uh, input from uh, whoever's transmitting. Uh, if their uh, material is good um, it's, uh, it's really you know, very nice. Yeah, I know that the, from what Peter um, Cousins was saying at a lecture I attended about 18 months ago, that the uh, from this distance, 3Ks, whatever, uh, I could almost use a dongle transmitter to get into the repeater um, if it was placed in the right position, um, you know, just a few milliwatts. Uh, but I, I'd sort of like to look at what's going on there first, um, and I have to justify it in the face of um, having equipped myself here with decent webcam, decent internet connection. And as you might see, I don't know whether uh, you're aware, but the, there's quite a bit of lighting here I've experimented with <laughs> to try and minimise the wrinkles. <laughs> Ego. Um, anyway, I better hand it round to... Uh, uh, um, John VK3 Double G, if you're still there, John, for a final. Then Peter to tie the ribbons. Um, VK3 Double G and the group VK3 AML, if you're still there, John. 
John's gone uh, QRT, uh, Chris, VK3VJS. Ah, hi Jeff. Yeah, I'm glad to see you there. I'll hand it round to Peter then to tie the ribbons. Sorry, VK3ACZ, VK3AML. Oh, sorry, I weren't sure who you were handing it to. Yeah, VK3AML and the group VK3ACZ, and good evening, Jeff. Good to hear you on. Saw you on the video earlier. Hi, hi. Um, yeah, well, n nothing more to add uh, from here. Interesting to see what happens to uh, Novax. Uh, <laughs> we've obviously all got an opinion about it one way or the other. It sounds like we're pretty much all on the, on the same page, too, for what it's worth. And uh, another interesting night spent uh, contemplating things, and this time it was hoarding. Um, not an affliction I'm in a hurry to uh, uh, succumb to or experience myself, but uh, I gather it doesn't cause them too much distress always. But there you go. Um, thanks again, Chris. Looking forward to next week already. Uh, we can uh, do it all again. Have a great week, everybody, and uh, thanks all for taking part, and everybody's contribution is appreciated by me, uh, but especially yours, Chris. Uh, good night and 7-3 all. VK3 AML and the group VK3 ACZ. Yeah, VK3 GG back to say morning. There was a telephone in the background, so I had to cut it rather short, but that's all dealt with, so... Uh, I'm back to uh, to say morning, afternoon, evening, and daytime, whenever this might get replayed, and uh, all being quite entertaining. Um, yes, uh, and the other fellow was talking about the, the different response people have to drugs. So I've read that's actually part of the problem developing drugs in the first place because of all the uh, people with slightly different um, physiologies or whatever they are. So it might suit one person, make enough one very sick. Anyway, on that note, we say morning. Well, one only has to look at people that smoke. I mean, some people can get away with it and still be smoking at age 100. And a lot of people, though, drop dead of arteriosclerosis caused by it or lung cancer or any of the other diseases that smoking causes at a very early age. So yeah, the response of the system is different. And the consistency of drugs is frequently inconsistent. Anyway, thank you all. Um, I'll be back uh, next Saturday, same bat time, same bat channel, 9.30pm. And uh, a final announcement regarding um, Australia Day, uh, 26th of January, Columbia Park, Wheelers Hill, uh, a ham radio confab for anybody who'd like to roll up, including shortwave listeners if they're listening. Um, at Columbia Park Wheelers Hill, probably be starting about 10.30 thereabouts, and you'll see a group of guys with portable transmitting equipment doing strange things to microphones and tablet computers. Uh, Columbia Park Wheelers Hill, 26th of January, Wednesday, around about 10 to 11 a.m. to start. So I hope to see some people there. All the best from VK3 AML and now clear of 147.475. Yes, and a very final final. Yes, I was talking to Herb Stevens, 3JO, many years ago, and he said the same thing of asbestos because he said all his life as a plumber he used to put in asbestos roofs and asbestos flues and all these things. He used to happily grind it away with the sander and the angle grinder and breathe all the asbestos and... Uh, well, he lived to the age he did and nothing happened to him, whereas some people uh, just touch a bit of asbestos when they're 20 and they're dead in a couple of years. Yes, yeah, it's all to do with physiology and the chemistry of one person must be very different to another. All the best, John. VK3 AML clear. Morning. VK3 VJS. Thanks, Chris. I watched it right through. Very, very interesting program. And I reckon that chap with the German accent was in in uh, the UK because he said a fiver. That wouldn't be five right marks, that's for sure. It would be five pounds. <laughs> and all the bottles and tubes he, for squirties and everything was all in English. So uh, that's where I reckon he, uh, he resides, Chris. And uh, good morning, John. And uh, as I said before... Uh, hoarding very close to my heart. I'm not as bad as some, but uh, I'm not good either. <laughs> Cheers all, VK, 3VJ is clear. Yes, good day, Jeff. Yes, pub dinner on Tuesday. I don't know whether you got the email, but uh, 
Yes, well, I've spoken to many people who do things like vintage cars and vintage motorbikes and radio and all the rest of the lot and say, well, you can't really get out of having to hoard to some degree because if you're going to try and keep old equipment running, it forces you to collect multiples of whatever the equipment is because you can't just go down to the local shop and buy a new part for it. So what do you do? At any rate, um, I've got to do something here. I was banking on next door's garage, leasing that, but uh, her brother's got a tandem trailer in there, so let's put uh, the Kyber on that. I want to do it in a separate room, completely separate, like they do when they clean out houses on telly. They take it all to a separate place and then have tables and sort it all out. That's what I want to be able to do, not under pressure. Uh, there you are. Righto. Thanks again, Chris, and good morning, John, and uh, all the others that may be listening. VK3 VJ is clear. Yeah, um, thanks for coming on, Jeff. Uh, I had intended, had COVID not spiked, to have seen you by now, but with 40,000 a day, um, I'm going to leave it a little while. Yeah, OK, Chris. I've been very lucky. I haven't been tested because I've never felt the need to be tested. And I have my second jab on the 6th of March. So what's that, um, three months or something? Two months? Any anyway, rate, I'm, I'm feeling OK. And I got a good report from the specialist yesterday. So I'm, I cut down from three rubs of testosterone over a period of time to two rubs and because the report was so good, um, a blood test a week ago, I'm down to one rub now, Chris. On the stomach, that is. <laughs> <laughs> and everything else is A-OK. -okay. Blood pressure and liver and, and all the rest, that, yeah. yeah but, um, cholesterol and everything, so I must be doing something right. OK, good morning, Chris. Catch you later. OK, 3VJ is clear. Yeah, cheers, Jeff. Um... After I go clear, I'll download, just in case there's some copyright problem, I'll download uh, tonight's transmission off uh, what's there. And if necessary, I'll re-upload it without the, 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 the copyright material in dispute. Uh, but it should pass muster. All the best. VK3AML now clear. Yeah, right, I see you there, Chris, and I don't know whether we're going to see you at the Royal Pub in Upper Ferntree Gully there, Jeff, on um, Tuesday. No, no, John, no, thank you. Right, and we say morning. Morning. And for the people on the stream, thank you for popping up and keeping with us. Um, I see that there is still something like, what, 8 or 10, 11 um, still watching. I'll now conclude. It's uh, quarter to one in the morning on Sunday, the 16th of January, and uh, um, thank you all for being involved. It's been a very interesting exercise in producing stuff that relates to amateur radio, but kind of in obl oblique ways. I'm trying to find new, new, um, new ways of looking at things. Um, one thing I want to exploit in the future is uh, individual interviews with amateurs that have done interesting stuff. Um, one that I can think of in Hobart is Mike Groth, my collaborator with the light beam stuff, who did a lot of work with radio astronomy in New Zealand in the 70s, some fairly um, cutting edge stuff. And uh, even people like... Um, um, Peter Cossens, who've done a lot of work with ATV over the years, to talk to him about his past might go down quite well, I think, as inserts in this, and I certainly have the portable recording equipment to make it an easy job. Thanks again. Um, hope to see you lovely people at 9.30pm uh, next Saturday, which will be the... Um, the 22nd of January, uh, four days before the uh, Columbia Park thing. 
and uh, a th final thank you to the very courteous way that Andrew Wright stepped in um, when my previous peak limiter finally turned its toes up in the middle of last Saturday's transmission and caused us three minutes worth of blank audio. Um, so that uh, that peak limiter, the old peak limiter, sadly is headed for landfill. It's um, all surface mount material. I cannot find a, a circuit diagram for it on the internet. It's too specialised. And uh, it's not immediately obvious if any of the electros are oozed. So I'm afraid it's a bit of a write-off. So we're investing another couple of hundred dollars in a, a new... Behringer MDX 2600 which is the one that's operating on my voice at the moment and uh, from what I can hear through the headphones off air and through the mixer it sounds like it's pretty good all the best folks um, I'm now